Silicon Flatirons is a research center at Colorado Law School. We work with students to give them the tools they need to pursue careers in tech, law, policy, and entrepreneurship. When I started, Silicon Flatirons was an experiment. It was me and some students putting on a few conferences without really a plan where it was gonna go. My initial motivation was because I didn't believe you could have impactful policy discussions unless you brought people together across different disciplines. Silicon Flatiron Center has given me an image of what a team can look like. And it really made Boulder into a location that was seen as on par with DC or Silicon Valley and other places around the country that are leading thought centers in the field of law and tech. What's excited me uh, the most is to see it grow, but not only just grow in terms of the number of people attending our different events, but growing in terms of the different areas that we have been involved in. When a law student says, I've got a passion for understanding the intersection of technology and law, but where do I get started with that? What Flatirons provides is addition to actually go angle for a job during their second summer, where they're actually gonna to get to be involved directly in setting tech policy or in advocating around tech policy. The Silicon Flatirons community is incredibly unique in how close it is and how people are willing to band together to move conversations forward. It's one thing to be sitting in a room by yourself reading articles, and it's very much another thing to actually be sitting at a table talking to somebody about their daily experiences of trying to navigate compliance with a complex new law. We're all a community of uh, friends who enjoy spending time with one another. The people we engage with through here are very much thinkers and thought leaders, so they're contributing to whether it's our strategy or our resources in really meaningful ways. Uh, Silicon Flatirons has changed the dynamic between Colorado law and the surrounding community as well as the national community. One of the great joys of my profession is talking to people who are really early in their careers and helping them get excited about what you're excited about. We get the types of people in the room that everyone thinks should be talking to one another, but often are not. I get to work with students, I get to work with attorneys, I get to work with policymakers at the intersection of all these issues. Students are first and foremost, so uh, everything is generally student-driven, and it is centered around people who are wanting to engage with students. I've seen students uh, come into Silicon Flatirons just having a little interest in it, you know, in year one, and by year three, uh, they're passionate about it and they found their career. And I think that that really helps the um, standing of the university more broadly, and it also attracts lots of really interesting and talented speakers. I think what I'm excited to see happen with Silicon Flatirons in the next five, 10, even 20 years is for it to blend continuity with change. It's not enough to have smaller conversations anymore. The world is all connected, and Silicon Flatirons is going to reflect that global nature of the internet as we move forward into 20 years in the future. I hope it continues to operate with the same spirit of experimentation, of adventure, of seeking out new challenges that we've done over the first 20 years. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Vanessa Koppel. I'm the Senior Events Manager for Silicon Flatirons. Um, as we kick things off today for day one of the annual Spectrum Conference, I just have a couple quick housekeeping notes. We are in the Zoom webinar format, so that means if you're an attendee, we can't see or hear you. Don't worry about your microphone or your video. Just enjoy what we show you on screen. Um, we are offering CLE credit today uh, with um, all of the panels. So if you're interested in that, the affidavit will be sent with the uh, survey after the event. Um, CLE materials are available from the event webpage um, under the resources tab. And if you don't know what CLE is, that's okay. You might not need it. <laughs> um, after the uh, panels today, we are meeting over at AirMeet, which is a browser-based platform um, to preserve the hallway track um, so that speakers and students and attendees can all mingle and talk together. So we hope to see you there. 
Um, all of the information is on the event map, which I will chat to you. And without um, any further ado, I'll turn things over to our executive director, Amy Stefanovich. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I want to offer a huge thanks to Keith Grumbin, Pierre DeVries, and Dale Hatfield for putting together such an amazing conference. And I'm going to hand things straight over to Keith to give an introduction for today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Silicon Flatirons Conference on Evidence-Based Spectrum Policy. Um, I'm Keith Grumbin. I'll be the host for your conference. I'm a senior fellow at Silicon Flatirons and a research professor in engineering and applied science. Uh, we're pleased to have everyone here today, and I think we've got a great program prepared, and we're all looking forward to some great discussions. Uh, first, let me uh, reintroduce Amy Stepanovich, the executive director of Silicon Flatirons. Uh, Amy has spent a career at the intersection of law policy and technology and has been actively engaged in protecting human rights and laws and policies involving technologies and their, and their use. Uh, she's a, also a nationally recognized expert in domestic surveillance, cybersecurity, and privacy law. So Amy, some opening remarks, over to you. Thank you, Keith, and thank you again. Um, it's so really great to be here with you all today. Um, in addition to my thanks earlier to Keith, Pierre, and Dale, I wanna give a thank you to our staff, um, Vanessa, who you just heard from, Heather, Nate, Sarah, and Catherine, for all they do to make these events possible, as well as to two really special students, uh, Rachel Anderson and Wilson Scarberry, whose help has been truly invaluable in getting to today. Before I go any further, I wanna step back and begin by acknowledging that wherever you're tuning in from, we are meeting on the land of First Nations peoples. The traditional peoples of the land of Boulder are the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations. And I'd like to pay particular respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, who lead these communities. At Silicon Flatirons, we elevate the debate around technology policy issues, support and enable entrepreneurship in the technology community, and inspire, prepare, and place students throughout all of these important areas. There are a few things that we believe in more here at Silicon Flatirons than the power of community and of interdisciplinary coordination. And I believe this conference is going to be a perfect showcase of both of those values. Today and on Thursday, you'll hear from technologists, policy wonks, and experts from academia, government, and the private sector. You'll also see students engaging with the material, asking questions, as well as during the breakout groups, which I hope you will all attend, and you'll find more information about those in your reminder emails. During this event, I wanna pose one challenge for all of you to truly open yourself up to one new idea that you either hadn't heard before or perhaps had been actively hostile toward. We live in difficult and cantankerous times, but at Silicon Flatirons, our goal is to rise above that and provide space for people to come together and for new thoughts to emerge. So before I turn it back over to Keith, two final thank yous. One to our supporters. Even during these harsh economic times, our supporters have held us up and given us the ability to provide programs for our entire community. And we are deeply grateful. And finally, thanks to all of you for tuning in and for learning with us and for engaging all throughout our conference today and Thursday. And without further ado, back to Keith. Thank you, Amy. Uh, today's conference on evidence-based spectrum policy is the second of two conferences we've held here in Colorado uh, in the past few months concerned with the issues around ensuring reliable and secure access to wireless services. The first event held in August was the 2020 International Symposium on Advanced Radio Technology, or ISAR. This was jointly sponsored by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, and the University of Colorado. ISAR focused on identifying the challenge for assured access to spectrum in a zero trust environment. Now, Spectrum, of course, is a finite resource, and Spectrum sharing is a major policy tool for enabling reliable, secure access to Spectrum. So our conference today and Thursday builds on ISART by exploring the policies required for Spectrum sharing, and in particular, we'll examine the role of evidence in Spectrum policymaking. 
Our conference takes place over two days, Tuesday and Thursday this week from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Mountain Time or noon to 3 p.m. Eastern. The format is roughly the same each day, a keynote address, panel discussions to explore the issues concerning evidence in spectrum policy, Q&A following each panel, and then a virtu virtual breakout rooms at the end of each day. Uh, please help with attend the breakout rooms. We're trying to capture the hallway experience uh, that you have in a face-to-face -face conference by setting up these virtual environments to give attendees the opportunity to interact with the panelists and moderators. So everybody who registered, um, you should have received the link to the breakout rooms and the instructions for joining. A couple of reminders to our moderators and panelists. Uh, Silicon Flatirons follows the wiser rule that students get to ask the first questions. And a reminder to everybody um, to apply the no acronym rule. Remember that the audience and panelists may be from very different domains. So please define all your acronyms on first use. And so now I'm going to hand off to uh, one of our law students, Rachel Anderson. Rachel is a second year law student that we've managed to infect with the spectrum bug. She interned this summer with uh, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration this last summer and helped out as a volunteer for both ISART this summer and today's conference. So Rachel, over to you. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, I'm extremely honored to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Tiaga Nandagopal. Tiaga is the Deputy Division Director of the Computing and Communication Foundations Division in the Directorate of Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the National Science Foundation. <laughs> it's a long title. He oversees an annual budget of $200 million devoted to advancing the theory and foundations of computing and communications. You can find more details in his conference bio online, but for now, I'll cede the floor to our first keynote speaker who we're very grateful to have with us here today. Hey, uh, can you hear me, Rachel? Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Silicon Flatirons, uh, Keith and Rachel for uh, inviting me over here. Uh, and uh, for giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, about Spectrum and what the future holds for us in this space. So thank you. As uh, Rachel mentioned, I am um, at the National Science Foundation. And in my vantage point, I get to oversee much of the Spectrum and wireless networking and communications research that the National Science Foundation funds. And just for context, for those who are not familiar with what the National Science Foundation does, in the field of computing and communications, the National Science Foundation funds nearly 85% of research that is done in academia in the United States. So just for context, it kind of tells you, um, you know, the kind of important role that we play and also the fact that, you know, by virtue of funding all of these um, majority of ideas uh, that, that is uh, in some sense uh, carried out uh, in academia, we get to see a lot of ideas that are coming and all the things that you don't see that, you know, we kind of think of is probably not appropriate enough uh, or ready enough to fund. Uh, so with that in mind, I want to kind of make a small caveat here, which is that uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to be talking about my perspective, and this is not something that you should construe as reflecting the views of the National Science Foundation. I will talk about some programs that the NSF supports in this space, but again, the, I'll be very clear in indicating when that's uh, NSF uh, advocacy, then not um, bulk, bulk of the talk in some sense is going to be my own uh, opinion in some sense. So take it with that uh, huge grain of salt. Uh, and also uh, many of these ideas are not new. I, uh, I remember discussing some of these, uh, actually most of these ideas in some sense uh, in 2015 with a new program officer at DARPA at that time. Uh, many of you may know him by now, Paul Tillman. Uh, and you know, like, you know, we saw a lot of uh, synergy in our shared opinions. And uh, you know, we, we had some very interesting collaborations that came up as a result of that. So with that, let me get into uh, what I would like to kind of uh, start off with. You know, before we get into the future, right? We need to kind of, all, uh, help, it's helpful to look at the past a little bit. And here I'm going to use my tinted glasses, right? I'm going to use a, do a very select history of uh, how spectrum has been come to be used and regulated 
uh, with the view of kind of sharing what I, where I think the future is headed. Um, you know, it's for the students of history, it may not be, uh, you know, this may be old news, but you know, in the 1900s, radios were first used on ships. And uh, you know, the thinking of the Titanic uh, kind of made it clear that there's a lot of commercial interference in radio traffic, and there is no regulations really per se that were guiding which ships should operate on which channels. Uh, and the fact that you know you need to have a guard band between uh, uh, adjacent transmissions was something not appreciated very much. And therefore, Congress passed the Radio Act of 1912 that proposed the first regulations of spectrum in that sense. But then, by and large, things were you know going along. You know, the largely ungoverned kind of the Wild West in some sense. There were some regulations, but uh, not very well enforced. Uh, and by and large, uh, broadcast. Again, when I talk about broadcast, I'm not talking about radio use for uh, communications. Uh, public radio broadcast that relied on you know popular entertainment and other uh, uh, methods of kind of dis disseminating content was largely self-regulated and self-governed, uh, and you know there was a lot of interference. People complained, and then you know they kind of adjusted their powers and so forth. Uh, very hands-on and distributed governance, right? Uh, and then of course in 1927 um, there was uh, an update of the Radio Act, and the F F Federal Radio Commission was established, and the notion of creating radio licenses, spectrum licenses uh, came about. So that was a big jump. Uh, and then in 1934, the Communications Act of 1934 was passed that kind of made the FRC into the FCC and expanded its mandate uh, to not just look at radio, but also communications as a whole. Uh, this include wired, uh, wired and uh, wireless, right? And broadcast and everything, and content that to be important. Uh, so it started looking at everything. So. That, in some sense, is you know a large uh, uh, the regulatory history, but then you know uh, very interesting things happened in 1941 to 1945, which I won't go into uh, the details of. You know, people can read up in uh, in history books on this uh, on this particular one. Uh, but a few important court cases and uh, you know uh, technology trends made it uh, an established fact that oh my God, spectrum is scarce, and therefore we need to be very careful in how we use it. Now, again, remember at that time, the spectrum that they're talking about was a few hundred megahertz. That was it. And back then they said, that's it. It's very scarce. We cannot use a lot of, there's not a lot of it to go around. And therefore we need to be careful in allocating spectrum. Uh, of course, we know that's not true anymore. It's not no longer to a few hundred megahertz. It's, we're talking about thousands and thousands of it, gigahertz in fact. But then the other thing that happened in that time frame was, uh, there was this initial uh, thing that, oh yeah, you know, spectrum is scarce. But so we need to be careful about how we use it. So with that in mind, the FCC at that point embarked on an effort to relocate and place limits on uh, how the spectrum can be used. So AM stations, for example, which are the dominant spectrum use uh, category at that point, uh, they forced some stations to re as a relocate uh, to different bands. Uh, and at the same time, they used some kind of uh, studies that done on interference uh, uh, from um, uh, solar, uh, flares and other effects, atmospheric effects, to place limits and constraints on where FM could operate. Now, there are some um, controversies about the validity of that study and what, what really motivated those. But again, the point that I would like to make though is that these two principles that govern us today, in some sense, well, yes, frequency is scarce and you know, um, relocation is possible, but you know, it's a lot of work kind of originated at that point in that time frame, right? And of course, there's a, like a long hiatus, you know, things were moving along, evolutionary progress, little by little, uh, but by and large, the allocations, licenses, you know, the principles didn't change much. And of course, in 1994, the FCC decided to, you know, uh, embark on, well, let's monetize spectrum. Uh, and they started auctioning spectrum, which was a huge shift, okay, uh, in how spectrum was used. And then there's big jump, and which many of you, uh, in, you know, who remember recent history are very, very well aware, well, came about when TV white spaces were reallocated, right? I mean, there was a forced relocation in some sense. I mean, with the incentive driven, of course, uh, where TV white TV ch channels were asked to relocate, and uh, uh, the resulting white space was reallocated. So that was a big shift, and of course, in, uh, uh, a much bigger success story that I think many of us uh, in the spectrum policy uh, world would love to kind of you know go back and do case studies on is the fact that we had this three-tier uh, access system for the CBRS band that came about after a very lengthy, right, it lasted almost three years, discussion process 
uh, and then which continue to get refined over time. You know, even as the late as last year, we had some uh, actions kind of clarifying some of the use policies around this map. So, so keep this in mind. Okay. So this, uh, the reason I want to go through this um, is because I want to kind of hit upon a few common themes that has, in some sense, dictated how we use spectrum until now and why it may or may not be a hindrance for us in going forward. Um, uh, and I think the first thing is spectrum is scarce. Okay, this is a principle that keeps going in and uh, that, that kind of guides our discussion. Everywhere you think that you know, every literature on spectrum starts off by saying, we don't have enough spectrum, right? Spectrum is scarce. Yet, as we have seen time and time again, technology has enabled us to tap into more spectrum that we otherwise thought was not available and not possible to use. Right, and the more recent example is millimeter waves. Right, I mean, until you know, I think uh, ten years ago, it was completely ruled out for you know communications, uh, land to land communication, terrestrial comms by outdoor communication, and yet now that's touted as you know a big space where five G can flourish. So that's one example. The other theme that I think it's uh, important to keep around is yes, moving spectrum users around is hard, but Despite that principle, it says, well, it, when we really want to make it happen, when we really have a value around a certain spectrum and we want to say, well, we don't want these people in that, in that band, we need to move them around to someplace, it happens you know, almost by magic, right? It seems to be limited by economic and policy constraints, but is that really the case? It's not clear, right? Uh, while people think it's, it's hard, it is not impossible. It, it can happen, right? And the third important theme is, Regulators are always willing to try new methods of spectrum allocation, yet it takes a lot of time to make it happen, right? And the key reason is that they would like to make sure that no harm comes to uh, an incumbent, for example, or someone who is in an adjacent band. And in order for that to be satisfied, they require data from studies. And from the inception of radio, uh, this has been an issue that we do not get unbiased sources of data that regulators can rely on. It always, the data seems to always come from folks who have a very clear stake in the game in, 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 in a certain policy approach one way or the other, which creates problems, right? It creates uncertainty, number one, which delays things further, okay? So that's one. Um, so anyway, so that's other thing. So where are we today? So we have been living in a world of fixed frequency assignments, right? Again, many of these have been set for many years ago. Uh, we have unlicensed spectrum bands, but these tend to be governed by emissions rules, uh, mainly, you know, in a, a set by a desire to coexist and be nice to each other. Uh, but again, it may or may not have a desired impact of being useful. Uh, you know, it limits its use uh, in some sense. Uh, and we are seeing an innovative use coming up, for example, in the 3.5 gigahertz and maybe more uh, to come, right? Uh, the six gigahertz uh, proceedings, for example, uh, is something of uh, interest as well. So this is where we are. And the way I would like to, for us to think about, if, if you draw an analogy to wired communications, the fixed frequency assignments are the equivalent of a dedicated circuit, where each company got a dedicated circuit. I want to connect two campuses of my network, I will create a dedicated circuit. Uh, and the unlicensed spectrum band is like ethernet, right? It can't go too far, right? It's limited by the length of the cable, but you know, hey, it works. You don't have to have a uh, very fancy protocols for it and you can use it. And shared use in some sense, you know, the three tier access system you know, gives you the impression that yes, you know, I can ask for a capacity if it's available on demand, I can relinquish it when I don't want it. So I have this on demand shared circuits kind of analogy, right? But in the, wire, in the wireless world, this is the state of the art today. In the wired world, that was like 1993, right? We are like almost 23, 27 or 30 years behind the curve as to where the wired world is today now and where you know, we are in the wireless world. So this is a, a gap that we need to bridge and where do we need to be today, right? So if you imagine how your wired networks operate today, right? I have my cell phones that can connect to multiple uh, networks, right? multi home end devices. Again, it could be through my wired ethernet. You know, if you're in the office, for example, your, your, your office process, network provider would have you know, uh, multi-homing between multiple networks, backend networks, right? 
you use switch ethernet at the edge, ethernet is no longer the shared medium, right? It's almost like a switched network that there's no contention. Uh, it's not a our problem. And you can use carrier aggregation and achieve fantastic speeds, right? 400 gigabits is standard now, and you can go even higher now, right? And you can, at, at the back end, you can have interconnection agreements with multiple carriers, and you can just, you know, you can negotiate these uh, fairly quickly. So what is the wireless equivalent of this? So this is a question for us to consider, right? This is, we are very comfortable with our data networks up today. We don't see a problem there, right? Uh, so why can't we get to that kind of a state with the wireless world? So here's where I would like to pause it. And again, keep in mind, this is my opinion, and this is a spectrum future. This is one possibility, right? There are endless possibilities, and this is one that I'm gonna postulate today. Imagine, us having a set of unlicensed, unrestricted frequencies, right? Again, unlicensed and unrestricted being key, spanning all bands, right? Low, mid, and high frequency bands, right? I'm not saying that everything should be like this. I'm saying, let's imagine that we had a set of these bands that give us enough flexibility to go pick and choose. Uh, each of them having their own desired propagation characteristics and so forth. And devices that some sense want to communicate uh, with each other they can self-identify the desired swath of frequencies and power levels and the time slots to get their data transmitted. Let's assume that's possible, right? Now, these devices in some sense will require, they'll have to be part of self-aware networks that can learn on the fly what the status is, you know, whether when they can communicate and when they can, uh, you know, uh, when they should be quiet. These networks can be highly resilient. Right, because you're no longer limited to a band, right? Nobody can spam you anymore. Nobody can like denial, do a denial of service and you know uh, drown your power levels on one level. You, you can just hop and skip and do what you want, and you can figure out a way to reach uh, across any kind of barrier that may come up. So you can create a very highly resilient network. It may not be highly optimal in terms of its uh, capacity, uh, efficiency of the spectrum used, but it's highly resilient and unregulated, right? I mean, it has potentially, in some sense, it doesn't have the restrictions that we normally operate under, and you can adapt based on the demand that, you know, you see uh, for the communication uh, needs that you have, okay? Now, again, I am not uh, saying that, uh, uh, when I say communication, like, you know, one may think that this is all about data. This is not necessarily about data, right? You, you may have wireless devices that do not use data communications, Right? We may have radars and others you know, existing in the space. And this is a future that incorporates all of those. They may be passive users who are just simply listening uh, to certain frequencies at very low power levels. You have to, in some sense, incorporate all of those devices uh, into this future as well. Okay, so imagine this future. This is important to have. Now, is this a crazy idea? Now, again, I, I want to go back to what Amy said earlier at the, at the start of this event. You know, keep an open mind, right? I mean, there is dogma that prevents us from considering the possibilities out there and more so in the spectrum world. And I've seen this enough with uh, every conference and workshop. Every time I hear somebody say, this cannot be done, I keep thinking, why not, right? And this future that I've outlined earlier is within the realm of possibility. And why do I say that? There, uh, there was a DARPA spectrum collaboration competition, the SC2 challenge, uh, which I, as I mentioned earlier, Paul Tillman uh, was the program officer uh, who ran that comp challenge at that time. And this particular competition kind of touched up on this. It took a very small narrow band, 50, uh, 50 megahertz, right? And it just tried to do what I just said there uh, by creating some constraints around a common uh, collaboration channel and creating a common uh, information exchange mechanism and so forth. Uh, so while it was very preliminary and a primitive attempt at doing this, uh, realizing this feature, the outcomes of it showed that it is feasible to do this kind of distributed uh, coordination and still achieve seamless operation and also get efficiency gains as well in many instances. Now, what was the key issue that they identified, right? Self-awareness, being able to learn on the fly and trusting what the data that you learn, uh, whether it's reliable or not, and uh, having a measure of how much can I rely on it, uh, having that awareness in some sense is the primary challenge needed uh, for us, for uh, a network or a device uh, uh, to operate in such a future, right? 
And an and interesting outcome of that, of that, and there's something becoming more and more clear now to many folks in the community is that artificial intelligence, in some sense, can help us realize that self-awareness goes, right? And uh, you know, uh, there was a workshop uh, that was held last year in uh, August in, at the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, where uh, there was an interagency workshop where this was focusing on artificial intelligence and the intersection of uh, the techniques used there with uh, how wireless spectrum can be uh, can be benefiting from that. And this became very clear that AI can be used in many ways to realize that kind of a future where you know you can create self-awareness and which in, in some sense can in turn help uh, achieve the optimization goals that many have dreamt about, but in some sense have been prevented by existing assumption, uh, assumptions around how networks should be. So what we really needed there is flexible radios, okay? Flexible, when I mean flexible, like radios that can hop and span multiple bands uh, and you need computation at the radio, right? At the device. Uh, this is something that is missing today. And, uh, you know, more and more, uh, uh, you know, experimental researchers are realizing that you need to do a lot of computation uh, at the radio device itself. And, you know, these devices should be able to accommodate diverse waveforms because if you are going to pick and choose the right uh, time and uh, band uh, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and power levels to communicate, you need to be able to use appropriate waveforms as well. So that's from the hardware side. Now, in terms of uh, policies, right, you need distributed consensus protocols. How do I achieve a way to identify, okay, what should we use and how do we prevent us from uh, interfering with somebody else who's also using the channel uh, uh, or who's nearby at the same time? So you need distributed consensus protocols. Uh, and this is something that needs to be done, right? This is not, there's no uh, uniform uh, single protocol that can do this uh, right now. And we also need a light test regulation, right? So you want to kind of let this, uh, what do you call it? I wouldn't call it anarchy because this is a term that's been used to kind of malign such uh, uh, frameworks in the past. You need to keep a, a loose hand, a light touch on, on the system. Okay? You have some high level constraints, but uh, let the system evolve by itself. So that's the, the protocol policy level, right? And then of course, at the, at the, at the mechanics, at the tactical level, you need situational awareness and continual learning and inference that is happening at, uh, at the ground level, uh, both at the, at the radio device environment level, as well as at the macro level, where somehow the knowledge that's of what's happening in the network can propagate and communicate and inform the ground level decisions that are made. So how to do it, right? And again, I would hear, again, I come from the National Science Foundation and this is, uh, now I'm gonna put my national NSF hat on, uh, not just my personal opinion. I would say that uh, we need a lot of research in, in this space, right? Distributed consensus protocols, for example, is alone, I would say worth maybe 30 or 40 PhDs. You know, there's so many, so much interesting research that needs to happen there. Uh, and clearly the NSF, the Department of Defense and DARPA and many others are pumping money into this problem right now. Uh, the fact that 5G and uh, what happens, what comes after 5G uh, is, uh, is, is the forefront of the national conversation it means that there are hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe even a billion dollars uh, over the next 10 years is at play right now, right? And that's, that's a big amount of investment, right? Um, and I would like to call particular attention to some of the programs of the National Science Foundation, you know, uh, in particular, the Spectrum Innovation Initiative uh, calls for a center scale investment in wireless spectrum research. And this is a $25 million or five year effort, which we really, really hope can address this, this kind of spectrum future. I mean, not necessarily advocating for my specific idea, but the kind of interesting ideas that will come about that can help us get past the dogmas that have plagued the spectrum community from its inception over a hundred years ago, right? Uh, so that's the research part of it. And we also have funded some fantastic platforms, test platforms, because remember, you need this hardware that I talked about, flexible radios, diverse waveforms, right, and compute at the edge. And these currently exist at the three platforms that we have funded already under the platforms for advanced wireless research. It's Salt Lake City, New York City, and Raleigh, as well as the Colosseum uh, emulator that we uh, work with DARPA uh, for the SC2 that is now hosted at the Northeastern University in Boston, uh, you know, it's available as well, right? And these can, in some sense, provide the place where you can test out some of these very interesting concepts, the kind of futuristic scenarios that you would like to uh, see in the spectrum world. Uh, and of course, NSF has now embarked on a concept called National Radio Dynamic Zone, uh, 
Uh, again, there's not enough time to go over it today, but you can definitely look it up. Uh, the Google search will get you there. And we have lots of research programs in wireless that are looking to kind of harness the ideas that are out there in the community. And many of you right now sitting here in the audience may be thinking, wow, okay, this is great. How do I participate? I would say, you know, keep an open mind. And I would say, uh, you know, look at what this particular conference is trying to do, which is data-driven uh, decision making, right? And uh, what is AI going, uh, relying on? AI relies on data. And in some sense, that's what we need. If you can figure out how to marry that data, how to get the data and how to marry that to effective decision making and how to use that effective decision making to kind of append established notions of spectrum allocation and use, then please submit your ideas to these programs, okay? So in conclusion, I'll be wrap it up by saying that the current spectrum allocation model is not working. Everybody says this, and there's a clear need to innovate. Everyone says this as well. We really need to have creative thinking, and I believe that artificial intelligence and data-driven learning as well as inference is going to be extremely helpful and critical to making it happen. And I think this conference is on the right track for you know, stimulating the discussion and looking forward so much to hearing what the panels have to say about this. And I would say, I beseech everyone to leverage the current R&D programs, this huge tidal wave of investment that's coming into wireless spectrum and use this because this is an opportunity we're not gonna get maybe in another 10 years, or for another, after 10 years or so. And uh, you know, a billion dollars or more going into these programs is uh, good money to waste if we can't solve all these problems today. Okay, so with that, I'm happy to uh, stop now and take one questions. Tiaga, I have a question for you. Um, so in the, in very early on in your slide deck, you were talking about being able to move spectrum users, um, mostly being a uh, attributable to like a desire to make that happen, um, which gets me thinking about incentives. And I was just wondering if there are any lessons that we could be learning um, from the international arena in terms of how other countries who have, who incorporate that aspect into their spectrum policy um, very regularly, if we could mm -hmm. be learning a lesson about incentivizing that um, from, from them. Right. Uh, I absolutely agree. There is a lot to learn from different policies, but also there's a caveat that what happens outside is not always applicable here. Uh, and I, uh, and I, I would uh, defer to my, uh, uh, there are a lot of colleagues from the FCC and the NTIA who are in attendance today, and I'm sure they have a lot to say there. Uh, one observation that I have felt always uh, has been a challenge for uh, the spectrum allocation in the US is people use the spectrum allocation that they have been given as their uh, birthright. You know, they kind of say, oh my God, I have this allocation. How dare you give it to somebody else? They don't understand it's just a lease. It's just an it's a, it's a option given by the government. It's a public airwaves that they are essentially giving the option to utilize for their benefit. And this is, it can be taken at any given time. And that message needs to be reminded time and time again, that it's not a right. And it's just a facility that's being granted as a matter of convenience to make things better for them. The economic costs of these have to be incorporated definitely. I think that's something that, you know, be the cost requires interdisciplinary research. But I think the, often the cases have, uh, for, oh my God, this is going to be so expensive. This is going to cost billions of dollars uh, are mostly oversold, I think. And I think that uh, there, there is a need definitely for more realistic practical assessment, not just looking at the cost of transition, which is always what these studies tend to focus on, but also to kind of offset what is the cost of transition being offset by, which is the gains of operating in a newer spectrum with more cutting edge equipment, uh, which are much more efficient, for example. So I think that uh, wholesome analysis, not just focusing on the transition per se, but focus on the gains that they realize after the transition and use that to offset the current costs. That's something that needs to happen as well. So I, I see a question there. Uh, I don't know if you want to take that, uh, Rachel. I'll defer to you. Sure. So we have a question in the Q&A. Um, uh, the question is, the concept sounds good, 
consumer and perhaps enterprise needs, but worrisome for public safety and critical infrastructure industry users. How can you guarantee quality and reliability in any shared spectrum scheme? <laughs> right. And, and here is, uh, this is one of the other dogmas that kind of plague us, right? It's this assumption that, oh my God, you know, uh, so anything shared is means that you're going to lose quality and reliability. And I'll go back again. Your office networks today rely on ethernet. And you are having Zoom calls on everything on these things. I mean, I'm right now I'm connected on ethernet. I'm, kind of, I'm using Wi-Fi right now uh, to, uh, to talk to you all. And so are most of you. And yet we are able to talk and communicate to each other. And we, yes, there are sometimes when there are glitches, but often, more often than not, it's not necessarily just your network at fault. It could be other factors at fault. And this is on a best effort service. Wi-Fi is a best effort service. And to say that you know, a shared spectrum scheme cannot provide reliability and quality, I think it's a, it's a false claim. I think you know, we, there are ways to make it happen. It's just a question of us coming to a common understanding uh, of to what different classes of users who may want to exist and making sure that they get priority access uh, when they communicate. So I think that's, uh, you know, that's a, one of those assumptions we need to kind of be very wary of and not make that assumption all the time. Okay, I'm going to jump in here. Thank you very much, Diago. We appreciate your, your comments and remarks, and I hope you'll be available for the breakout session. I'll try to join at the end of the day. Yep. Great, great. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our, our first moderator for our first panel. Um, our first panel addresses the basics of evidence-based policy making, and I couldn't think of a better moderator for this panel than David Rettel. I had the pleasure of working for David when he was the NTIA administrator and I was the director of NTIA's laboratory. Prior to his stint with NTIA, David served as chief counsel for the communications, for communications and technology on the majority staff of the US House Committee on Energy and Commerce. And I should add, David is a senior fellow with Silicon Flatirons. Over to you, David. Be nice if I actually started my video so I could be on camera. Thank you, Keith. It's good to see you. Uh, I'm, it's nice to see all of your faces to my Colorado friends who I have not gotten to see since I haven't been on a plane in the last seven months. But um, thanks for joining us today, everybody, uh, for the kickoff panel of Silicon Flatirons event, Exploring Evidence-Based Spectrum Policy. As Keith mentioned, I'm David Ruddle, founder and CEO of Salt Point Strategies and a senior fellow at Silicon Flatirons. Spectrum policy continues to be among the most important topics for tech and, policy, tech and telecom policymakers. And as this group knows, understanding the implications of spectrum policy are rarely simple and far from intuitive for those that haven't made it their career. Facts, knowledge, precedent, history, research, and yes, evidence are all part of making the case for specific policies, policies but they can be maddeningly complex and can come with far reaching consequences. Since we've been asked to set the stage for this important topic, we'll take a high level look at what makes for evidence-based policymaking, why it's important to our increasingly spectrum dependent world and how it can be best employed to make good policy. Our panelists today have spent their careers making, influencing and honing spectrum policy and we're thrilled to have their experience on this panel. In lieu of opening statements, I'll briefly introduce each of them and ask them what is evidence-based policymaking to you and how is it different or is it than what we think of when we look at how policy is made now. First up, Blair Levin. Uh, Blair is well known in communications policy circles, so I'm gonna give you all the lightning round version of his resume. Chief of Staff to FCC Chairman Reed Hunt, National Broadband Plan, Brookings, GigU, Aspen, Leg Mason, Stiefel, and now Policy Advisor at New Street Research. Blair, I left out so many of your accomplishments, so please forgive me, but thank you for joining us. What is evidence-based policy making? Uh, thank you very much, David. And I just want to confirm that I'm no longer muted. You can hear me, right? Great. Um, so I, I always start by thinking about well, what's the opposite, in this case, policy-based evidence-making, uh, which is often the way governments, uh, agencies act w when they want to um, adopt a particular policy. And then they just make up the evidence uh, to justify that policy or, or cherry pick the data. Um, and, and that is a very common practice uh, on a bipartisan basis. I would say that evidence-based policy making uh, a couple of key things to me when I've seen it work. Number one, it starts with questions, not answers. That's the absolute 
uh, criteria. But of course, no one was ever elected by promising the American public that they would ask certain questions. Rather, they're, they're elected on the basis of the answers they give. So there's a, there's a lot of political um, uh, emphasis on um, just, just coming up with the answers that were essentially already promised. Uh, second, it, it relies on data that is routinely gathered as opposed to data and information that is gathered solely for the purpose of, um, of, of getting uh, a, a certain result uh, or ad ad addressing a certain question under the APA or something like that. Um, in, in any event, uh, again, the APA process tends to focus people on certain things. Everyone knows what the options are. And the evidence is not coming out of kind of standard routinized efforts, but rather very uh, focused ones. Uh, and then finally, I would say it relies on a cultural norm in an institution that believes in facts, believes in science, uh, which involves, by the way, challenging facts and testing certain things, and also believes in course corrections. I think all of those things are hard because of political pressure, but nonetheless, it does happen. I'm sure we'll be talking more about it. But let me just close the intro by noting that a couple of days ago, our little world, um, oh, and I should have mentioned what the APA is, that's the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, our, our little world, I think, celebrated really a tremendous accomplishment, which was a Nobel Prize in economics to two of the economists who not only worked on the first spectrum auctions in the mid 90s, uh, but also played a key role in other auctions around the world, as well as the incentive auction that the FCC did in uh, 2016. Um, and the, they're getting that award in some sense is a tremendous reaffirmation of the FCC in terms of its own ability to do auctions. Uh, if those auctions had failed, I don't believe they would have gotten that award. But I do want to make the point that both the theoretical work that they did was not, was not evidence-based because there was no evidence before they did it. <laughs> Nothing, these things hadn't been done before. And further, there was a lot of work that the FCC itself did where they were guessing, and we'll talk later about some failures, but some of the failures are because we were trying things, and I'll be happy to admit what they were. We were trying things that hadn't been tried before. So when it comes to that which surrounds spectrum policy, not the interference issues, but kind of the allocation issues, um, it, it's sometimes difficult to do evidence-based policy making because there is none. You're on mute again. Thank you. Uh, was that a landline I caught in the background? Uh, that was a landline. <laughs> How great! How a landline. <laughs> How wonderful. Well, we we're very nostalgic here. <laughs> Old habits yeah. die hard, Blair. <laughs> Thanks for, yeah. for your yeah. opening on that. And I'll move to our next panelist. Uh, our next panelist is Kate O'Connor. Kate's the Chief Counsel for Communications and Technology with the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, Kate previously worked at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration for an outstanding Assistant Secretary and later an outstanding Acting Assistant Secretary of Commerce. In her time there, she worked on legislative and communications policy issues affecting spectrum and broadband and later served as Chief of Staff. Prior to joining NTIA, she worked at the U.S. Senate for Senators Mark Kirk and later Senator Dan Sullivan. Kate is very second city, hailing from Chicago and later attending the University of Chicago. Kate, thanks for joining us. What is evidence-based policymaking to you? Thanks for having me, David. I, uh, as you mentioned, I did have the pleasure of working with you and Keith <laughs> during my time at NTIA, so that was entertaining. Um, so obviously now working for Republican leader Walden, has been a great honor. I've been there for about a year at this point. Uh, and during his time on the Hill, he really has been a leader in communications policy. I would say, especially this year, it's been a very interesting year to start a job working in this role on the Hill, given the current climate of everything that's going on. Um, but especially in light of COVID, I think the demand for connectivity has been seriously emphasized. Uh, you know, everybody's working from home remotely, carriers are upgrading their services, making sure that people can stay connected. Um, you know, even before this crisis, Ranking Member Walden has always tried to find ways to make more efficient use of spectrum and make more spectrum available. And so when we're talking about evidence-based policymaking, you know, he is, I mean, Blair covered a lot of it, but 
uh, ranking member Walden was really the author of the incentive auction and which has been a resounding success in making spectrum available. But that was a unique model and it had never been done before. So when we're looking at evidence-based policymaking, especially in this role, being on committee uh, in the House of Rep Representatives, you really have to take a holistic look at all of the evidence that's out there, look at where, where the demand is, where the incentives are to make those uh, policy decisions, and then what, what is actually achievable and what will work for your, in your boss's best interest. So I don't know, you know, it's always great to have data when there is data there, and I think it's important to look at all of the data, but it may be, you may sometimes have to make a decision based on, you know, certain numbers or statistics that might be there, but also the economics of a decision that you're going to make or what the projected economics might be. And those, those factors are always changing. So there's really, at any point in time, I would say the facts are different and you just constantly have to reassess the information that's available to you. So I know we're going to get more into it and uh, I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Great. Thanks, Kate. Uh, from the U.S. government. We'll now turn to our neighbors to the north. Our next panelist is Adam Scott. For almost 20 years, Adam has been advising the Canadian government on a variety of telecom policy issues. He's currently the Director General of Spectrum Policy, where he sets broad direction for Canada's Spectrum Regulatory Framework and is also responsible for running the Canadian Spectrum Auctions. Adam, since you share the name of the actor who played Ben Wyatt on Parks and Recreation, I promise this will be my last Pawnee, Indiana joke. Adam, thanks for joining us. What is evidence-based policy making to you? Thanks very much, David, and uh, and thanks to all the organizers as well. Uh, even though I'm I'm far away, I can still feel the the Colorado hospitality. Uh, so I'll confess that the the first thing I thought of when I heard that evidence-based policy making was the the theme of the conference uh, was actually the, the TV show Law and Order. Uh, and I know it's a, a little bit ridiculous at a you know, an evidence conference to, uh, to rely instead on such an, an analogy uh, and maybe even a flawed analogy rather than evidence. Uh, but we've all seen the show uh, and we know that it revolves around the process of discovering, uh, assessing and interpreting evidence in an attempt to uncover the truth. Uh, and that eventually a, a decision has to be made, right? A judge rules at the end of the show uh, and that decision is gonna affect real people in real ways. Uh, so the judge needs to get it right. Uh, and so I think the analogy is useful. Uh, over the next few days, we're going to be talking about things like witness testimony and credibility. Uh, we'll be talking about motive, uh, supporting evidence, scientific evidence, uh, where it can come into play and where it might have some limitations. Uh, and I would suggest to everyone, uh, if at any point during the conference or when you're back at home or school or work, uh, and you're struggling with a particular aspect of spectrum policy that, that might prove difficult or challenging, uh, to try reimagining it as a procedural crime drama and see whether or not that might help you shed any, any additional light uh, on your struggles. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I, I'm, I'm a, I guess that makes me a poor man, Sam Waterston right now. I would kill for his voice though. Um, I appreciate your perspective. And with that, our final panelist is Scott Walston. Scott's president and senior fellow at TPI, the Tech Policy Institute and is also a senior fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. Uh, like Blair, he was part of the US National Broadband Plan team as economics director and has held numerous scholarly positions in economics doing research on competition, regulation, and tech policy. Scott, thank you for joining us. What is evidence-based policymaking? Um, thanks, David. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's kind of funny, first of all, to think uh, that this is sort of a new idea um, you know, if we're only starting to think about evidence-based policy making now, what were we doing before? Uh, and um, and like Blair said, uh, you know, often it's been um, evidence-based policy or policy-based evidence making. Um, but really, po uh, evidence-based policy making is about thinking of issues in sort of a in a cost-benefit framework. I think that doesn't necessarily mean monetizing everything, um, but recognizing that uh, that you're weighing uh, often trade-offs and you know, and benefits and costs, and it's uh, it's not just following the data, but it's a willingness to allow data and experimentation to guide the right way to achieve particular policy goals. Um, but it it means that you have to be willing to try new ideas uh, and be willing to admit when an approach isn't working. And 
you know, that's hard for people. People become sort of uh, invested in their ideas. It's natural to be. Um, but you have to be, you know, willing to see when things don't work and, and, and stop and stop doing them and, and, and to try new things. And, uh, and I think that's what's, that's what's very hard to, um, to implement in, in policy. And you know, Blair mentioned uh, the, the economists who just won the Nobel Prize for their auction work, Paul Milgram and, and Bob Wilson. Uh, and of course, there were a ton of people at the FCC and, and otherwise who helped put their ideas into, into action. And that was an example of where um, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of evidence um, beforehand, we and, and this was a way of uh, trying to create a uh, an incentive compatible mechanism to create evidence on what where spectrum was actually going to be the most valuable. Whereas before, it was mostly people arguing about it, although they used different kinds of evidence. Um, but so there, are, you know, there are different ways to define and think about evidence. Uh, and but I think you know the, the most important part of it that makes it useful is when people are are willing to question their priors, um, and and rethink ideas based on based on new information. Well, thanks, Scott. I, you know I I think you all sort of touched on um, a little bit of what we what we wanted to get to in terms of how evidence based is a little bit different. I will say before we turn to to our questions, a few housekeeping matters. Um, we will be taking audience questions uh, at the end if we have time. So if you have a question for the panelists, please use the chat feature to ask your question. And thank you to my colleague, Fiona Alexander, who I volunteered to help me in fielding the questions in the chat. So much appreciated and thanks, Fiona. Uh, now on to the questions. So Blair, I'm gonna come back to you, I think, with the first question to start with, uh, just because it's been the longest since we heard from you. So you, you touched on this as has everyone else. How is evidence different than just data or knowledge? Because as anyone who has participated in either an industry Canada consultation or an FCC rulemaking knows, there's plenty of data that's provided. At what point does that start to become the evidence for evidence-based policymaking? It's a really hard question. And I love the analogy to Law and Order, a TV show I actually have not watched very often, but but, uh, but think it I mean, Blair, sense. it was on for like 97 seasons. How did you <laughs> miss it? <laughs> well, um, uh, this is where this way, there's so much on television these days. Uh, <laughs> one has to make choices. As Scott said, it's cost benefit trade offs, all of that. Um, uh, but I do think it does a great job of telling the public as, as, as did, you know, when we were certain kids like me reading Sherlock Holmes or Encyclopedia Brown or whatever those books were, about how do you interpret uh, a number of different things and how people interpret things differently. And of course, you know, we see this with every FCC proceeding uh, we've ever seen. There is a difference in my mind between those things which are fundamentally matters of law in which you're citing kinds of precedents and interpreting words, and those things which are particularly in the spectrum realm um, matter of what you might consider more scientific evidence, particularly on the question of interference. And I think interference is one of those things that um, uh, is a little bit different than a lot of what policymakers do, but maybe one of the most important things that the FCC does. And, and frankly, I think one of the things it does best, uh, the Office of Engineering and Technology has uh, really done a very good job uh, under, in, in a very bipartisan way, of looking at what we might think of as real as, as, as real evidence. Or another way of saying it is, evidence is what remains after the decision maker discounts all of the data and information. In other words, what are they gonna rely on? And it, but it's really different. You know, I, in one of the most important issues that was brought up this year, um, uh, the trial judge in the T-Mobile Sprint deal, um, basically based his decision on evidence presented by the, uh, the CEO for T-Mobile saying, we're not gonna raise rates because I promise not to raise rates. Traditionally under antitrust, you would look at economist models and he basically discounted those and, and relied on his and, and did a very long piece in his uh, decision talking about how judges determine who's telling the truth and who's not. I don't mean to either criticize it or praise it, simply to say it was a very surprising kind of thing for a judge in an antitrust case to do. But what I think that demonstrates is how one person's evidence 
is often uh, different than, than somebody else's evidence. So I'm not sure we have a clear definition other than it's what the decision maker thinks is most probative of what the final result should be. Scott, if I can pivot over to you for a second, you know, I, I think Blair teed up, you know, another item that I, I think we all want to talk about, which is oftentimes the record in these um, proceedings, particularly on technical matters, becomes dueling engineers on the record. Um, each side gets an engineering firm to do a study with certain assumptions that makes their case. Um, and the perceived value of those can be higher or lower depending on who has done the work. And I don't mean the firm, I mean which side of the argument has presented it. Um, does it matter whether it was a private party or the government that produced the evidence in these kinds of policies? And should it? Well, um, when you have interested parties, uh, you, you mean they're, they're not going to submit a report that does not support their point of view. Um, but, you know, that also includes the government, uh, which often also has an interest. Uh, I, you know, I think the most important thing in that is, is transparency, uh, to know not just who uh, paid for the work, but, but that you can also um, interpret the work and understand the assumptions that they made and what went into it. And then, you know, uh, uh, you, you might look at it as, uh, you know, if, if it were the, in a legal setting, then everyone has the right to make their case. Uh, and then someone is supposed to judge between those two. And so both can, you know, both, both could be making correct arguments. Um, and then, then it, you know, it falls to whoever is the de ultimate decision maker to decide which one they, um, which ones, you know, how, how they, how they place value on, on the different sides. Um, but I think, uh, you know, a, a key, the reports have to be done with enough information that the reader can figure out, uh, you know, sort of where the rabbit went into the hat, right? What, what helped them get the results that they got in the end? And then that helps you figure out how, you know, how much weight to put on it. Um, but, you know, it also, it also gets to a point, and, and Blair was raising this point, that um, someone has to set the question initially. And, you know, that's the question then that this evidence is supposed to help answer. And setting that question is often much harder because that's about different preferences. And um, policymakers from different areas legitimately have different policy preferences. And so sometimes the evidence-based part is about how to most efficiently get to a particular outcome. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's harder to move the evidence part to setting the policy objective in the first place, I think. Fair enough. Adam, when, you know, I'm, I'm going to turn to you for a second. You know, as, as you look at these, you see these come into the record on consultations. Um, how, how do you look at dueling engineering studies when you're trying to make good evidence-based decisions? Yeah, it's and, a good or how, and or how does the person you have read them for you look at them and help you understand <laughs> them as the case may be? <laughs> yeah, no, and, and I am pretty blessed to have some pretty good people helping me out. Uh, I mean, one, one of the things I liked about your setup is that it, it almost implies that, you know, information coming from the government has uh, some, some inherent credibility. Uh, I'm glad to see there's some people who still think that, at least to some extent. Um, it's, it's not something that we take for granted or that I think we should take for granted. Uh, we actually work pretty hard, you know, not just to be able to understand that evidence, uh, but to be able to produce evidence of our own that is that is actually credible. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to your question, I, when I was coming up, the, the simplistic rule was, you know, you, you listen to everything that they tell the regulator, then you listen to everything that they tell their investors, uh, and you, you split the difference, and therein uh, lies approximately the truth. Uh, you know, but it does get into, I mean, uh, again, to, to kind of stretch the, the analogy a bit, you know, you're looking at their motive, uh, you're looking at their narrative, uh, where does this lead, where are they, where are they trying to lead you? Uh, you know, and it's a, it's a question of credibility, which I think we all acknowledge requires a certain amount of judgment, uh, with, comes, with, comes with experience, comes with time and patience to do your homework. Um, you know, you absolutely can't take this stuff for granted. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. There's much more to it than that. We have, you know, the reason we, we dedicate our careers to this stuff is because you need a couple decades worth of judgment to really sit down with some witnesses who appear credible and compelling and put a ton of evidence on the on the table. It's not easy at all.
Kate, to you, when uh, oftentimes in contentious rulemakings in Washington, D.C., um, the, the, the parties cry to Capitol Hill to try to get things moved the way they would like to go. When, when you're working for Mr. Walden and the members of, uh, of the subcommittee, how do you look at this and, and how do you sort of look at each of these pieces as, as they re relate to being facts versus evidence? That's a great question. So something that I have realized in, in working on the Hill especially is that nearly every party can find data to support their argument. So no matter what the position is getting pushed, whether it's, you know, if somebody says an apple's green and another person says it's red, there will be data to support those facts. Um, so I think it really is important to listen, to look at all of the data that's out there and really look at it in a, in a holistic way. But I also think that, especially in the communication space, it's very unique in that it is so new when it comes to the policies that are getting enacted and some of the challenges that we're facing today. 20 years ago, the spectrum crunch wasn't nearly as real as what we're dealing with today. Um, and in different ways, I guess, you know, the federal government had significantly more assets uh, versus today, a lot of industry has assets and consumers, you know, rely on that spectrum for their connectivity and their services. Um, but also, you know, in 2012, FirstNet was an unproven concept. And now if there were to be another case where there's something like that, there's evidence that that is working and that that model has worked. So I think it's, it's difficult. It's always difficult, but you know, looking at evidence, the evidence is constantly going to change. The data is always out there. People are always going to be able to come up with new data, support their, whatever they're trying to push. Um, and what it kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning, when you're looking at it in a holistic way and then looking at whatever new evidence is actually coming based on previous policies that have been enacted, you'll eventually end up at a place that you find is best for your boss that's actually achievable and that can hopefully achieve the outcome that you're trying to get. Great. Um, okay, well, you, you've given a, an example. So um, in deference to our government friends and letting them off the hook from not having to dance around being mean to their employers, uh, good, bad, and ugly time for the non-government panelists. Um, Blair, you know, what are some examples where it's worked, where we could have used more evidence to come up maybe with a better outcome, or or an example where we just straight up ignored the evidence and did what needed to be done for a specific policy outcome? So when it comes to spectrum policy, uh, I would argue that kind of on the scientific realm of interference, we've actually done a pretty good job. And I would even go farther and say in some of the allocation stuff, I don't, I don't look at there being any disasters. The disaster that I would note um, because it's my nature to do it, would be one that I was involved in making, which was the C block auction of, uh, in, in the mid 90s spectrum. And the, the problem there was that we uh, responded to the congressional directive to get new enterprises involved in auctions, had a block that was all about new enterprises, uh, but we didn't want them to spend all their money on the spectrum auction. So we essentially gave them installment payments um, the problem was, and this is a, an example of, uh, you know, the, the, the economists deserve the Nobel they won, but uh, they, they didn't tell us everything. And one thing about installment payments, and by having everybody essentially bidding on them, is they were essentially bidding on option value, not real value. And that led to just some incredible um, problems. And of course, as, as some people might remember, a lot of that auction, then the, the, the buyers, the winners went into bankruptcy um, and the, uh, the spectrum was tied up for many, many years. So that, that was a, a case of bad uh, spectrum policy making, but I don't think it was a failure of evidence. The, the other thing I would just note again about um, uh, policy making, uh, to me, two of the more recent ones where I would say that was too bad, um, uh, with both the incentive auction and the C-band, but what was too bad was not the final decision, but was the time it took to get to the decision. I, I, I'm delighted that Kate thinks that, that uh, Congressman Walden was the father of incentive auctions. Um, you know, there's that old saying that uh, victory has a thousand fathers, defeat is an orphan. Uh, ordinarily, I would, I would be simply proud of the fact that someone else thought they were the father of it, but I have to point out since we're at Silicon Flatirons, that Phil Weiser actually wrote a paper for Brookings in 2008 proposing the idea. We, of course, picked it up in the National Broadband Plan, but our view was that we wanted to do it in a way that everybody could claim credit. Having said that, it was too bad, in my opinion, that it took 
so many years, and David, I'm sure you would disagree since you were there, uh, to do what I thought was a simple idea, could have been done in a sentence, um, but, it, but it took time. And I think that demonstrates how politics can interfere with good policy. We all now policy uh, that legislation. Another example is, is CBAN, where I think the FCC got to the right place, which was FCC just at that point. And then I think that put us uh, behind. So I would distinguish between uh, those things. The final point I would make is there's an asymmetry in terms of FCC spectrum policy, which is FCC has a lot of control over the transmitters of, spec of, of data, but much less over the receivers of data. And the transmitters can be, you, you can course correct with those, those folks, but once the radios receiving it are in the field, there's an embedded uh, uh, cost. It's very difficult to change those out. And a lot of different spectrum proceedings, in my opinion, have gone awry in terms of the amount of time it's taken or, or problems with certain bands still being lying fallow when they shouldn't is because there's that embedded base of frankly crappy receivers that are more susceptible to interference. So that's, that's some of the good, bad, and ugly. So I'm gonna, in the interest of, I, I realize we are running towards the end of our panel. I'm going to advance quickly through the remainder of the things we want to get out there so we can get to the student question. Um, I let Kate and, and, uh, and Adam off the hook so uh, I will let either one of you raise your hand, whichever one would like to say. Uh, do you have an example of a time where you don't think evidence-based policymaking would work? Adam, I think, uh, is, is that something that you can, you, you would be able to address? Yeah, I mean, I, I know, far be it for me to say evidence doesn't work, uh, but I think, and Scott suggested it a bit earlier too, there, there are certain types of questions that invite evidence. Uh, so I think maybe an important point to make is that how we ask the question can really frame uh, whether a conversation is useful or not. Uh, and an example I like to point to is a, a question that comes to me all the time, phrased a lot of different ways. Uh, so some people will ask, should we make you know, high-speed internet connectivity a human right? As a bureaucrat, I, I don't like that question. It's important, it absolutely, uh, you know, I wanna see people connected. Whether or not it's a human right is really more of a philosophical conversation. Uh, distinguish that to a question phrased as, you know, what are the social what are the social and economic benefits of connecting a community that hasn't previously been connected? That's the kind of question where we can really dig in with a ton of evidence, uh, you know, and do some really constructive work, extremely evidence based. Look at global models, look at you know all kinds of different uh, fields of study, and produce a really uh, constructive evidence base that's going to drive us towards something concrete. Uh, so I, I think I'd answered at least half the question, but uh, you know, the, the way we no, phrase I, our question. I, I think you did, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. I know we have um, a student question we want to get to. Uh, Gabe Rudin is the, uh, the CU student who is, is up with uh, the first question from the audience for our panelists. Uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank everybody for your time and your insights. It's really appreciated. Um, I'm. So yeah, my name is Gabe Rudin. I'm uh, a 1L here, so I'm a member of the class of 2023. And I have a question for Mr. Levin. And uh, my question is as follows. Uh, in a recent conversation between yourself and another one of our panelists today, uh, Scott Walston, on the Two Think Minimum podcast, you reflected on the successes of the 2010 National Broadband Plan. And in evaluating what that plan got right, you attributed your team's accomplishment to the praxis of asking, do we have the right information? Uh, but in addition to that, you lamented about the FCC's data collection deficiencies, and you additionally expressed a desire for that agency to have capabilities similar to that of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but for communications information. So my question is as follows. With profound advancements in spectrum technologies on the horizon, such as a true 5G rollout and the emerging IoT ecosystem, what types of data do you believe we should be collecting to create an effective spectrum policy? Thank you. Uh, it, it, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, I would, <laughs> as an American studies major, a liberal arts kind of guy, I would defer to a lot of others. Um, I can make the policy argument that uh, 
decisions are better when you have better data. And certainly, by the way, there's a bipartisan consensus in Congress uh, on almost nothing except for the fact that the FCC has not done a good job of collecting data and they passed the Broadband Data Improvement Act. Um, but I might defer to Scott Walston on that, uh, except to simply say um, that uh, I, I, I do think that having 70 uh, real experts who are used to looking at data made the plan a lot better uh, as to what kind of data should be collected now. I would love to hear like a lot of experts like um, uh, Julie Knapp who used to um, uh, run the Office of Engineering and Technology address that question. Well, Scott, do you have an answer to that? Yeah, well, first, uh, nobody should have let Julie retire. Uh, <laughs> also, Blair, why do you begrudge him a retirement? Let the man <laughs> rest, for God's sake. Um, no, the, I mean, the, 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 the where the where does the data come from question, uh, I, I think, is, is important. And what do we what do we what do we collect? Uh, those are those are really important. And the FC, a lot of the way we still collect data um, on on broadband and, and other issues, uh, the FCC is very it's very old. We we started we did a the, the census did a census of telephones in 1896 where they you know actually counted each phone. There was a census. And we've just continued to do it. And and so has I mean that's sort of the way the rest of the world now counts its lines, you know, number of connections. Um, but we really need to be supplementing that or if we even need to continue that sort of thing at all with uh, surveys of the type that BLS does uh, because they do it really, really well. And they do have a computer and internet supplement part of the current population survey. Uh, and I think we need to be doing more things like that. And, and they, they, it'd be nice to see the FCC and, the, um, and BLS work uh, together more on, on those data issues because they're both really great. I mean, BLS and, and BEA know how to do uh, surveys better than anyone else. And the FCC knows the broadband, you know, knows the data and what they're looking for better than everyone else. And I mean, we all criticize the FCC data, but it's not like, you know, we're all saying anything that the FCC doesn't know. Those people, you know, people who work with that data know the problems with it better than anyone else. Um, but we have to be willing to change the, the types of data, uh, change the type of data that we collect too. And, you know, there's a, another a related issue too, uh, that you know, it's good that when we collect similar data over time so that we can see trends, that's very important. But also the kinds of questions that we ask may change over time and that can require different kinds of data too. Uh, and, um, and, and so somehow you want a combination of that. So like if you look at Ofcom, um, they often have these very interesting reports and there'll be a different report every couple of years on, on a different topic. Uh, whereas um, at the FCC, they'll put out the same report every year and each of those has, has particular advantages. You know, you know, in the FCC and uh, the broadband report, you go to, you know, table 3.5. Hey, yeah, for, sorry. For just to pause for those in the group that don't know, Ofcom is the uh, UK's Office of Communications. It's a regulator in the UK. Right. Um, and also, that's a good point. It agrees a good uh, time to interrupt me because I was just sort of rambling. Um, but there are lots <laughs> of different ways you can collect data and lots of different ways to present it. And they all have different advantages and disadvantages. And it's hard to always get that right. And just one quick thing to add, um, in one of the questions, uh, David Robertson um, said, pointed out that uh, he, he said, so, you know, do we want uh, database policy? Uh, basically, that data... Uh, uh, evidence-based policy can also mean data that we don't have that we should be prepared to do we, to do experiments, and I that's something I I, I talk about a lot. Um, I think experiments are really important, particularly in areas that we don't know much about. Going to audience questions, I'm going to uh, paraphrase Toby Ul's question from uh, from the chat, which is you know asking basically you know um, evidence and politics can sometimes be at odds, and the government decision-making process is inherently a political one. Can you set up institutions that are doing policy to discount politics in favor of evidence? Anyone can choose to jump in here. Well, I'll, I'll simply say yes. Um, uh, and, and one example of that is spectrum policy in terms of auctions. Uh, let's face it, Congress fundamentally uh, wanted to maximize the amount of revenues the great insight of Milgram was the, the, cur the winner's curse. And so the auctions are actually designed not to produce the maximum amount of revenue. Um, there were other issues in terms of concentration and stuff. 
Um, and we, in a very conscious way, tried to insulate the auction design process in 94 and 95 um, from, from political interference. Uh, and I think we largely succeeded. It, it helps that it was <laughs> such complicated auction theory that most of the members of Congress kind of gave up or they just, they didn't understand what we were doing. But I do think that that point of isolating and insulating um, uh, certain kinds of cultural institutions from political interference is a doable thing, but it requires commitment to do it. And I would say, you know, without g g going into a partisan rant here, I think one of the things that historians will look back on is the part of, uh, how the CDC became corrupted during the COVID crisis as one of the worst things, uh, both in terms of its immediate outcomes, but also in terms of the long-term ability of the United States to respond to public health emergencies. So it's really important that some institutions um, are isolated, but obviously you can't do that with everybody, nor should you. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you the tenuous link since CDC also technically does a study on wireless only households in the United States. Uh, so I guess there's some telecom tie yeah, in there. Right, right. Um, but in the last few seconds we have left, and I realize we are at bingo time here, um, crystal ball time. What decision pending or that is, uh, is on the horizon do you think would most benefit from the sort of evidence-based approach uh, we have described here? Um, Scott, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think we still need a way to decide um, an evidence-based approach to deciding whether spectrum should be allocated to unlicensed or licensed, because that is still left at a regulatory debate level, and we don't have good ways of making that decision. Fair enough. Kate O'Connor. You're on mute, Kate. Sorry. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, honestly, trying to figure out a way to, to isolate politics from spectrum decision making, or at least mitigate some of that, uh, is definitely going to be something that we're going to have to focus on going forward, especially as these decisions become more difficult and the demand for spectrum is growing. Adam Scott. Uh, for us, looking at some of the millimeter wave bands, where there's, there's so much spectrum and there's so much potential, uh, which is, you know, could support all kinds of different business cases, uh, but there's still so much unknown on how exactly that plays out. I think it's going to be super interesting to watch. Blair, you get the last one. Um, of course, the, the one that everybody is focused on right now is the uh, DOD 5G one. But I think the sleeper issue for the next FCC is going to be 12 gigahertz. It'll be interesting to see how they resolve some of those conflicts. And I guess we'll leave it at that. There are certainly panels that will be going into uh, this uh, in, as, we, uh, as we see the next two days of, uh, of panels and discussions on this topic. I want to thank our panelists for being with us today. Um, you have been wonderful and tolerated my bad jokes. So thank you very much. Thanks to Silicon Flatirons for hosting. And with that, I'll turn it back to Keith. Thank you, David. And thank you to all the panelists. That was very interesting. Uh, right now, we'll, we'll take a short 15, well, roughly 15 minute break. Uh, let everybody refresh a little bit, get, get a fresh cup of coffee. And uh, let's be back here at 1130 Mountain Time, 1.30 Eastern, and we have a special talk at that point. Thank you. <laughs>
we go. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're ready to kick off the second half of our, our Tuesday session here. Um, we've got a special speaker right now to give us some perspective on, on evidence-based policy. Um, Rachel, I believe you're turn it over to you to introduce him. Sure thing, Keith. Um, so I have the honor of introducing our next spiel, speaker, Dale Hatfield. Because Dale's list of accomplishments in this field is about a mile long and he's always staying busy, I'll let you know what he's currently up to. Um, he's currently an executive fellow at the Silicon Flatiron Center for Law, Technology, and Entrepreneurship at our very own CU Boulder. He is also currently serving on the Federal Communication Commission's Technology Advisory Council, that's TAC, and on National Telecommunications and Information Administration's Spectrum Management Advisory Committee, that's CSMAC or CISMAC, depending on how you pronounce it. <laughs> and in addition to everything that's already on his very full plate, he also has a new puppy. So without further ado, Dale Hatfield. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel, for the introduction. And thank you, Keith, for the opportunity to present some framing marks for this Silicon Flatirons conference. In the time I have, I'm gonna reflect back over my almost five decades of involvement in spectrum management, but I will do so in the context of the subject of this conference, namely evidence-based spectrum policy. In particular, I will focus my attention on what I regard as spectrum policy and regulatory shortcomings in four areas. Harmful interference, receiver performance, noise and interference measurements, and spectrum enforcement. Before I turn to the first area, I should mention that I'm going to be talk, talk going to talk a lot about radio frequency or, or, or RF interference. In interest of time, I won't bother to give a long formal definition of RF interference, <clears throat> a definition which I'm sure is familiar uh, to most of you and has been touched in remarks so far. But I'm talking about natural and man-made activities that cause disruption, disruptions to often vital wireless communication services. Examples include disruption caused by someone intentionally or unintentionally transmitting on a channel for which they are not licensed, or by somebody deliberately jamming GPS for nefarious purposes, or disruptions could be produced by vagaries in radio propagation that sometimes cause radio signals to travel far beyond their intended distances. There are many other examples, but uh, 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 I'll stop there. With that very brief background, I will turn now to the first of the four areas I want to address, namely harmful interference. One of the most fundamental issues in the spectrum policy realm is deciding what constitutes harmful interference in a given situation. But the truth is we do not have a quantitative, a quantitative definition of that term. Hence, two questions come to mind. First, why waste a lot of time and evidence collecting evidence when it is essentially useless in making one of the most fundamental decisions in the field? That is, does this measured level of interference constitute harmful interference or not? Second, how can we possibly improve spectrum management in an increasingly complex field using badly needed automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques without an accepted quantitative definition of the term? In short, automated decision-making requires information, that is evidence, if you, if you will, to, requires the evidence to be quantitative. Moreover, turning to the second area, receiver performance, even if one can decide 
whether or not a given level of interference constitutes harmful interference in a particular situation. How, is the how does the governing structure attribute responsibility or interference in an objective way when we essentially have no enforceable receiver performance requirements? Again, two questions come to mind. Who is to be blamed or sanctioned if the harmful interference is caused by poor receiver system design, implementation, or maintenance? Why should the operator of a radio RF emitter be pe penalized when it is the susceptibility or fragility of the receiving system that is at fault? While I'm addressing receiver performance, I will add parenthetically that I support strongly, I strongly support the notion of interference limits as a less regulatory way of dealing with receiver performance issues. The idea of interference limits was proposed several years back by our esteemed colleague, Pierre de Vries. With the significant danger of oversimplifying the concept, interference limits would allow the use of receivers or more properly receiving systems regardless of their susceptibility or resilience to interference. However, under the concept of enforce, uh, however, under the concept, an enforceable claim of harmful in interference could not be made unless the impinging level of interference energy exceeded a measured threshold. Despite the significant amount of tension given to it in the spectrum research community, including real world modeling of the concept, there has been precious little progress in act, actually adopting Pierre's idea, even on a trial basis. Speaking very bluntly and personally, one of my biggest professional regrets is that we have not that we have made so little progress in adopting enforceable receiver performance requirements during my many decades that I during the many decades that I have been involved in spectrum management, both at the FCC and NTIA, in the private sector and in ac academia. The fourth, the third topic on my list of four issues is noise and interference measurements. My comment, really my, really my concern here is that despite some strong recommendations from advisory committees and other engineers and scientists over the years, the government still does not make nor have access to geographically extensive long-term accurate measurements of radio noise and interference levels in different frequency bands. Uh, let me pause here and say the information I'm talking about is radio interference information. It's not the sort of coverage information or people getting uh, cellular coverage in a particular area. This goes to interference, in some, in, uh, interference in information or measurements. Now there are three at least three drawbacks associated with the lack of such measurements. First, the lack restricts our ability to determine in general where the noise and interference pollution created by billions of RF emitters is getting worse, or even better for that matter. And if it is getting worse, how much worse? We are focused in this conference on evidence-based spectrum policy but we lack compre the comprehensive data necessary to answer a very simple question. Are things getting better or worse? Second, if it is getting worse, what systems or devices are responsible either because of their RF emissions or their susceptibility to noise and interference? Where do we focus our time and resources if we don't know what systems or devices are most responsible for the deterioration. Anecdotal information is useful, but not dispositive. 
third, as I touched on earlier, automation and AI ML techniques hold out significant promise for dealing with the challenges that are presented by the growing demand for digital capacity. Growth is associated with increasingly heterogeneous wireless networks that now connect over 4 billion people and 10 billions and tens of billions of devices worldwide. However, by their very nature, such techniques require the acquisition and curation of large comprehensive databases to be successful. So to summarize this point, the lack of comp comprehensive, well curated noise and interference measurements not only denies us the data sets, that is the hard evidence, we need to address foundational issues in spectrum policy and regulation. It limits our ability to develop automation and AI ML tools. But these are the very tools we need to be able to sec successfully identify, mitigate and remediate intentional, unintentional and incidental sources of noise and inference in an increasingly congested and complex spectrum environment. The fourth and final topic on my list of issues is spectrum enforcement, which includes the identification, mitigation, and remediation of harmful interference. Even if one assumes that the first issue, three issues I raise, quantifying harmful interference, establishing receiver performance requirements, and creating and gaining access to properly curated measurements of radio noise and interference, if you assume those, even if you assume those are adequately addressed, evidence-based policy making, making may well prove futile without effective rule of law-based enforcement. But the fact of the matter is that the number of people at the FCC, that the FCC has outside of the Washington DC area, DC area devoted to the technical aspects of interference enforcement has declined drastically over the past few decades. As a result is my understanding that only the most egregious cases of harmful interference to public safety services are now pursued on site. Now, one way of compensating for the decline in, in enforcement resources and the exponential exponential increase in RF emitters at receiving devices is automation and AL, AI ML techniques. However, the full benefits of automation cannot be realistically achieved under current conditions for all the reasons that I talked about a moment ago. As an aside, one of the ways of compensating for the decline in resources devoted to interference management is for the FCC to delegate some of the statutory, uh, statutory power of the commission to private industry. Uh, indeed, the commission has pursued and is pursuing such approaches in a number of important proceedings including uh, TV white spaces, the uh, CBRS, six gigahertz and 4.9 gigahertz. While shifting some statutory requirements to the private sector may well be a justifiable response to the agency's lack of resources in an area that is so critical to our economic and social well-being and to the national defense and homeland security it does raise two significant concerns. First, it appears to me, as a non-lawyer anyway, uh, to raise questions about the legality of such a delegation under current statutes, statutes. And secondly, it brings to mind rather serious questions about transparency, a hallmark of good governance. For example, does a delegation to private entities reduce the ability of the public to access the information, that is the evidence, the subject of the conference, used in making important spectrum policy making decisions? My time is up, so I want to, and I want to leave time for questions or comments. So I will close now by stating my 
strongly held belief that pursuing evidence-based policy making may well prove futile if sufficient resources are not put into the four areas I mentioned at the outset, namely defining harmful inf interference in a quantitative fashion, establishing enforceable receiver performance requirements, three, creating or otherwise acquiring and providing access to curated geographically extensive long-term accurate measurement of radio noise and interference, uh, both in terms of sources and levels, and four, ensuring that adequate resources, public and private, are devoted to spectrum enforcement, including the identification, mitigation, and remediation of harmful interference when it occurs. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, hi, Dale. Um, I had a question for you. Um, so my name is Taylor Hartley. I'm actually an MBA student, uh, but I have a good deal of experience in Spectrum as a Navy veteran, but more so on the reconnaissance front. Uh, Dale, thank you so much for speaking to us today. I know that you were very busy. Uh, you brought up some great points and you discussed these four shortfalls in the collection of evidence and policy regulations. Um, however, you didn't offer any action that the government might take to resolve these problems. So what, in your opinion, is the next step? Well, uh, I would answer in, in general is the, is the first is uh, for both the government and the private sector just to, to take action. Uh, you know, if we'd have taken action on receiver performance, back when I was at the FCC in the 1970s, if we'd have tightened up receivers, then a lot of the problems we've had today would be gone. So I say, get, get, get started. Uh, uh, the, in terms of, for example, the, uh, the uh, need to create uh, databases of interference incidents, uh, that, that's something that's been talked about. That's been talked about a lot. And there's, we have carriers gathering information. We have other government agencies gathering uh, uh, interference information. And, and uh, like I say, there's no depository, no way that we can, we can use that, for example, in the academic world to develop better techniques because you can't find in a single place uh, 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 information that you need uh, to uh, uh, to develop uh, better techniques. And, and enforcement is a particular uh, concern of mine, as, uh, as I mentioned. And uh, I see as too often the situation today that we take a policy direction and spectrum and we only think about then uh, uh, enforcement later on. We don't have what I would call a, uh, a, a, a national architecture for enforcement. We need, you know, there's adversaries now that would like to disrupt our communications very badly. And we need, and, 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 and we need to think about enforcement from the get-go and not till after we've made fundamental architectural decisions in these uh, wireless systems themselves. So thank you, thank you for your question. Okay, and thank you, Dale, for a, a very stimulating, intriguing talk. Um, I'm sure we're all going to be thinking about a lot of these issues moving forward. Uh, now I'd like to, to move on to our, our final panel for the day. Um, our last panel for the day is on evidence and spectrum sharing policy among active services. And the moderator is Renee Gregory. I first met Renee when she worked at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and she is now the Senior Regulatory Affairs Advisor at Google. So over to you, Renee. Good to see you. Good to see you too, Kate. And I only wish I could see everyone else who is in the virtual room, but perhaps next year we will all hope. So thank you, Kate, to you and all of your colleagues um, and to the previous speakers, of course. It is no small task to put together a virtual conference or one that has gone as smoothly as this one. So thanks very much.
I also wanted to take just a moment to congratulate Paul Milgram and Robert Wilson on their Nobel Prize. It's not every day when there's a direct link between Spectrum and the Nobel Prize, and I personally was thrilled to see their work recognized. So moving on to this panel, I will briefly introduce the four speakers and also remind everyone that, like the first panel, we'll plan to leave some time at the end for questions. So please think of questions as we're going along and drop them into the Q&A box as you have them. Starting off, we have Russ Gierak. He is Director, IoT, CTO, and Industries at Cisco. He has more than 25 years of networking-related technology experience. His range of expertise includes IoT, connectivity of things, 5G, ORAN, analytics and big data, cloud, optical networking technologies, broadband architecture-related technical policy, and emerging market development. That's a lot. So Russ also leads an FCC TAC working group of industry SMEs on 5G, IoT, and ORAN. Next is Paul Galazzi. He is an independent telecommunications consultant to both the government and commercial clients. His areas of expertise include the development of advanced component, device, and system technology, advanced architectures, interference analysis, and spectrum policy, regulation, and acquisition. He has been active in broadcast, cellular, including 700 megahertz, AWS 1 and 3 and 4, and public safety, spectrum policy, and regulation. Julia McHenry is chief of the FCC's Office of Economics and Analytics and she is an expert in the economics of the internet, telecommunications, and media. OEA is a relatively new office at the commission that is responsible for expanding and deepening the use of economic analysis in FCC policymaking, designing and implementing FCC auctions, and implementing consistent and effective agency-wide data collections, practices, and policies. Before the FCC, Julia served for three years as Chief Economist of NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Last, but certainly not least, is Patrick Welsh, who is Vice President of Federal Regulatory and Legal Affairs at Verizon, where he focuses on spectrum and technology policy. He has worked at Verizon since January 2012. Before joining Verizon, Patrick spent nine years with T-Mobile, working in various capacities on their federal regulatory and legislative affairs teams. He has also served as an adjunct professor at the Catholic University Columbus School of Law. So thank all of the panelists for joining. And I think we've already seen today a lot of great discussion and teeing up some of the important questions around evidence policy and how it relates to spectrum sharing. So I'll dive right into the topic of this panel, which is spectrum sharing among active services. And to set the stage for our discussion, particularly for some of you who might not be quite as familiar with spectrum, it would be helpful to make this a little bit more concrete, starting with what exactly is an active service. I'm not an engineer, so engineers may correct me, but that my definition is a service that is both transmitting and receiving information. This conference uses the example of sharing between cellular and radar, and I thought that tied nicely to a couple of complicated shared bands that have been in the news in recent months and years. The 100 megahertz starting at 3.4 gigahertz, where the FCC is currently seeking comment on sharing, and the adjacent 150 megahertz in the Citizens Band Radio Service, or CBRS, which Thiaga noted earlier, as an example of a new framework for tiered sharing. While we probably won't go into great detail on either of those bands during our panels, and there are certainly many others, it might be helpful to keep in mind how our discussion applies to either or both of the, those bands in hindsight or moving forward. Now, going back to our previous panel, we already heard a great discussion of evidence-based policymaking. And this program generally defines evidence-based policymaking as the process of using the best available research to make decisions at all stages of the policy process. I also really like the August framing earlier of marrying data to decision-making. Now that all sounds great in theory, but what does that really mean in practice? And David's uh, kicked off the very first panel with a very similar question but I think it's a really important one. So I'll ask each of our panelists to respond from their pers perspective. We have the benefit of having an economist, a couple of engineers, and an attorney. So it will be interesting to hear how their views might differ. So starting, Julia, with you, 
what does evidence mean to you as related to spectrum sharing among active services? And to what extent do you think we are or are not already using evidence-based policymaking? Hi, Renee, um, and thanks for having me. And thanks for giving a shout out to Paul Milgram. Um, it really is a, a huge accomplishment and very exciting for the FCC. So we've been all kind of on cloud nine for him for the last 24 hours. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's exciting. Um, but turning to um, evidence-based spectrum policymaking. I, you know, I, so as you mentioned, the Office of Economics and Analytics was stood up. Um, it's just about a year and a half ago, a little over that actually. Um, and, you know, we've been spending a lot of our time doing cost benefit analysis um, and really elevating that, um, that economic analysis um, and essentially evidence-based analysis at the FCC. And so with respect to to spectrum, I think most of the time what we are thinking about is that really that ex ante evidence that, that we talked a lot about in the first panel, which is, um, and unfortunately, a lot of it comes in from the outside, although I think OET does an, an extraordinary job of developing evidence and looking at that, you know, looking at the evidence there and, and developing their own conclusions. But really, we are thinking about it in terms, you know, OEA is thinking about it in terms of a cost benefit analysis. So looking at the evidence brought in from both sides, evaluating that um, and determining, you know, what that means for, for the policy cuts that we're making. But I will also say that I think most of spectrum based evidence, you know, it, these days is really is ex ante and it's, it's ex ante in a world as the first panel made so clear in a world where every band is unique, every repurposing situation is unique. So it's, it is sort of combining what evidence we can find and glean that we think is appropriate and applicable with a whole lot of sort of theoretical understanding of what we think will happen in the future for this band. So, you know, I, I think most of what we're looking at is uh, economic and engineering filings, um, you know, what we think has happened in previous bands, but again, we're not talking as much yet about the type of real time evidence about how spectrum sharing is, is um, it is occurring, um, you know, and, and, and sort of taking that evidence in real time to make the right policy decisions for that band. Thanks, I think Julia. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks. Paul, I'll turn it over to you. You're an engineer. How do you think about evidence? And are we doing it today? You're on mute. That should be better. I think you're doing that already today um, in a sense of taking evidence into play. I think evidence comes in three pieces. One of them is in data. One of them could be in theory and the other one could be in modeling, which kind of combines a little bit of, of, of each of these. And a lot of it is brought in today in a variety of different methodologies. The problem that associates we get together with, with data driven or what, what is data driven is the need for metrics to actually tie the data to something else, okay? Data is empty until you actually actually put things into consideration as to what it means. And so that's, I think, where some of the, the gaps actually arise, or actually, where most of us make a lot of our living in the sense of having the arguments associated with, yeah, that data means this because it helps my client or me in that way, or this data means that because it hurts me and I don't want that to be uh, used. And so a lot of the actual arguments come down, not in the sense of the evidence-based uh, process, but it's actually in how that evidence is actually applied. And I, I associated that as an engineer and a lot of things that we do, a lot of work in, in developing systems is developing the right metrics. And evidence-based has to actually tie the data to the metrics. And that is where the tough time is for policymakers to do because that policymakers generally don't like to have strict metrics. They tend to like to have a little bit of give and take. So it gives them the opportunity to kind of do what they want. Thanks, Paul. And Patrick, we'll turn to you in a moment. But first, I want to go briefly back to Julia. We have a request if you could briefly describe what you mean by ex anti, ex ante for those in the audience who might be not be as familiar with that term. Of course, I, I did see that from Pierre. Um, so ex ante is where we're really looking bef before we make the policy decision. We are making as part of the rulemaking process, 
um, you know, using what evidence we can glean to make the decision as to what the policy will be. Um, and, and I want to sort of Make, make sure these are, that is a pretty big distinction, I think, for sort of the rulemaking process at the commission where a policy is made and then you sort of let it go and see what happens. Um, and so, you know, most of those decisions we're making before we, in fact, make the final decision, we're looking at that evidence. Once the decision is made, there's a question about how much more evidence or how can we integrate evidence at that point. And I think that's where the challenge is. And um, since I have the mic, I'm going to use it for a second to, to, to say something to Paul, which is, you know, I don't know so much that it's that policymakers don't like metrics. I think the challenge for policymakers is to define metrics and then define metrics that we can collect over time. So as, as Scott Walston was saying, you know, we're, we're still stuck in the counting lines, right? But it's, it is, it's, it's because we've been collecting that information for a long time. We know what it means and we can measure it and compare it over time. If you start to talk about metrics, you need to be able to compare the current metrics to past metrics. And that's where it's a real challenge for policy to, um, between policy and politics and innovation, keeping those metrics and ensuring that they continue to be reliable and appropriate to, to, to look for, you know, to sort of to make decisions on um, is a real challenge for policymakers. I love it. We're having a debate already, and we haven't even made it through opening statements. Um, Paul, I'll give you a chance to respond briefly if you prefer. If not, we'll go over to Patrick, who's been patiently waiting. You take it away, Patrick. So I think the way that we, we think of evidence-based uh, policymaking for Spectrum uh, it ties very closely to what Julia said, but also with what Paul said. Um, in, in terms of uh, Julia's uh, framing of it, uh, we look at it as cost benefit uh, analysis in terms of allocation and assignments. Um, and a lot of times allocation decisions are made uh, when we're repurposing spectrum from, uh, you know, a specific use such as say um, government radar systems or fixed links operations uh, to general purpose uh, commercial ap applications like mobile broadband. Uh, and a lot of times, um, you know, the cost benefits aren't evenly distributed. Uh, the incumbent systems see um, this repurposing as uh, merely a cost. There's no upside, there's no benefit. Uh, whereas the commercial uh, industry uh, is very excited about the benefits, uh, but they're not as um, attuned to the cost of the particular uh, uh, incumbent systems. Um, in a, you know, in a private market, um, you know, economic actors can negotiate those and come to a commercially reasonable outcome. Uh, but we see uh, time and time again, uh, when we're dealing with federal agencies, for instance, uh, where we can't negotiate, we can't uh, enter into um, commercial uh, agreements. Uh, and the policy levers uh, that we've relied uh, on in the past, uh, such as the Commercial, uh, commercial Spectrum Enhancement Act, uh, which allows for uh, federal agencies uh, to transition um, uh, systems off a of spectrum that can be used for commercial use and use a portion of those auction revenues uh, to upgrade their systems uh, tends to be or has been narrowly focused on clearing and vacating those bands. Um, now there has been some, uh, you know, an amendment uh, to that law uh, in 2012 with um, the Middle Class Tax Relief Act that allows for uh, some of that money to go for spectrum sharing. Uh, but um, we need to really look more at some of those uh, mechanisms simply because um, we're mixing disparate uh, uses. Uh, so we have commercial broadband on one hand and government, you know, military radars on the other. Both are valuable, uh, but we have to try to find a way um, to um, distribute those costs and benefits in a way that makes you know, sense for policymakers. Thanks, Patrick. And Russ, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what is evidence and are we doing it, using it today or reacting to anything that the three panelists have said so far about it? Yeah, so before we get into a debate, um, <laughs> let me make a couple quick statements. So first, congratulate the FCC on doing a good job, at least in an engineering perspective and delivering evidence-based decision-making Examples are six gigahertz um, spectrum as well as CBRS. I think those are really good ones. 
Um, the other thing is I was thinking about this panel this morning. You know, I, I went to the FCC's website and was looking at their national spectrum management um, directive. There's 21 key points, that's quite a few. I just wanna read number two from that list because I think it's really relative to this discussion. It's promoting transparent, fair, economically efficient and effective spectrum management policies, i.e. regulating the efficient and adequate use of the spectrum, taking into due account the need to avoid harmful interference and the possibility of imposing technical restrictions in order to safeguard the public interest. So to me, that kind of frames up a lot of things we're talking about here today. We're all looking at, you know, how do we get more efficient use of spectrum? And as we talk about evidence-based approaches, I mean, this is a data-driven approach, right? Everything we do in life is surrounded by big data. Um, no matter what it is, it's kind of like, why aren't we more proactive in leveraging some of that data um, for spectrum management, which was one of the scarcest resources there is, right? So I think as we look at a evidence-based approach, yes, we're doing it today, um, but that doesn't mean we're doing it enough maybe today. I think as we look at some of these bands where there's incumbent services, you know, there's a couple rules that come to mind, at least in my opinion. One, you know, I think this is from the first speaker even, do no harm to incumbent services. Um, the second one is we really need a simple approach. Um, you know, and I could say, you know, things about CBRS. I mean, it's, it's kind of a Cadillac model in a way, or um, it's, it, it's, it took a long time to develop and it's, it's got some economic costs there. Also, it, I'd say one size doesn't fit all. When we look at spectrum management and sharing, Incumbent services vary quite a bit in some of these DOD bands, for instance. And so just one sharing technique may not work across other bands with different services between radars or other uses. And then um, I think we really need to focus on maximizing the, the precious spectrum, little spectrum that there is, all while you know, making sure we stimulate innovation in those bands. But you know, there's a lot of opportunities here. I think leveraging evidence and more data we can open up tremendous amounts of additional uses and more efficiencies in spectrum. The challenge will be, I think, as Dale pointed out, you know, how do you measure some of these things like harmful interference, the noise, um, you know, and how do you really get to some type of enforcement and not a heavy handed enforcement, but maybe a, a more of a um, industry level enforcement, sort of like what's happening with multi-stakeholder groups and certain bands. But um, I think this is all open for discussion as we talk about evidence-based approaches. Thanks, Russ. So staying on the topic of what exactly is evidence and how should it inform policy, um, I'll start again with you, Russ, since you were last on the introductory remarks. Is evidence always scenario specific or are there general types of evidence that are always needed? I mean, you just alluded to every scenario being very different, but would love to hear you expand upon that a little bit. Yeah, I think there's some baselines that are very common in some of the sharing in terms of the evidence that should be utilized or collected and um, you know towards a decision. But again, I think there'll be some differences in terms of um, you know it could be receiver sensitivity or receiver interference. Um, it could be based on power levels. And I think as we, as we move forward with spectrum sharing, we're going to have to look at every aspect in that ecosystem that could potentially be um, adjusted to allow greater spectrum sharing. So yes, the evidence, there's a common set of evidence, I think, that could be utilized, but there's also some differences based on what the, the services in that band are. Patrick, what are your thoughts on that topic? How should we be thinking about spectrum evidence? Is it always specific? Is there some common framework that we should always be looking at when we're considering evidence? Um, you know, I think uh, the experience that we've had um, in uh, PCS, AWS, um, millimeter wave, um, tends, uh, CBRS tends to show that uh, it is, it's specific to the band, uh, it's, it's specific to the users and the uses. Um, uh, so I think every band's gonna be a little bit different um, and there will have to be different metrics that have to be developed um, 
to uh, understand those. Uh, but in terms of general um, uh, applicability, uh, I think you know Dale was spot on about uh, the need for um, enforcement, a robust enforcement mechanism. We can't have a successful spectrum management regime without an effective enforcement regime. Uh, and that enforcement regime has to be there to identify harmful interference when it occurs, mitigate it, and then remediate it. Um, and uh, we've seen a really good um, uh, process put in place in the CBRS band, where uh, the spectrum access, access system, which is essentially the databases uh, that control uh, access to particular frequencies, is a closed loop system uh, that in the event there is harmful interference, there is a mechanism to go in and stop it and prevent it in the future. In other instances, such as say the six gigahertz band, uh, the FCC had the ability to extend uh, the automatic, automated frequency coordinator, which is kind of like a SAS or a spectrum access system, uh, to all devices in that band. It chose to only do it to outdoor devices and decided not to uh, um, require it for indoor devices. So time will see whether or not that decision uh, was right. Uh, you know, the challenge we have is the decision is made and there's, there's really no way uh, to close the barn door once the, uh, once the horse is out. So kind of thinking holistically about these and making sure that the enforcement mechanism is baked into um, the, the framework from the beginning really helps to prevent, um, you know, um, uh, intractable interference problems in the future. And then when there are some, to be able to recalibrate and to adjust um, to fix those. Mm -hmm. And I, I really like that point. It's not just about making the policy, it's about enforcing the policy and monitoring the policy and seeing what happens, which brings me to my next question around evidence and it not necessarily always being neutral. You know, we see facts and figures and charts and graphs on paper and it seems pretty definitive, um, but it's never truly neutral. It's not neutral in the law. It's not probably neutral when it comes to spectrum. So how should people, whether they're in government or in industry, recognize and grapple with potential biases in evidence and the presentation of evidence? Is there any way that we can reduce bias through neutral parties or otherwise? And Paul, I will start with you for this one. You, know, you work for both industry as well as for the government and may have some particular thoughts on this. <laughs> yeah, I live both sides. Um... Unfortunately, even with science, uh, we have noticed that there are biases. Uh, when people are trying to make a, a, a hypothesis work in their favor, not in their favor in the sense that they're trying to do something nefarious, but more of that they have a strong belief and, and they want to actually show only the, the evidence that is associated with that strong belief uh, tends to bias their results. Now, is it needing to have uh, um, neutral parties? Well, the question is, how do you actually get the right neutral parties? And how do you fund those neutral parties to actually spend the time and effort that you need? The FCC has some challenges on that in getting the engineering talent, uh, as well as the uh, NTIA and the like. So it's, it's difficult to find those, those uh, unbiased uh, uh, or neutral parties. I tend to look at it as a possibility of arguing the same point, meaning when you do a peer review paper, okay, you're arguing about a particular hypothesis that is put out there. It isn't that you change the argument and try to say, I think this is good because of this. It should be, here's the major points. Now let's walk through each of those major points and have the argument of each of those points and look at the numerics and look at the models and look at that. What I've noticed in a lot of the, even in the spectrum world, the argument tends to change, is that people never argue about the same thing. They argue about slightly different things to try to make their point. And then therefore, hopefully that somebody could figure out and kind of wade through it. I've been on multiple occasions on both sides of the table of watching the argument just change in front of my eyes, where I'm saying, wasn't the real question interference? And wasn't it actually caused by these pieces of equipment? Aren't we talking about that? And all of a sudden, no, 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 I'm gonna lose that argument. Let's have a new argument. It should be very, in a some sense, like a peer reviewed journal, try to figure out, of course, those are going to the wayside in some respects nowadays also, but the idea is how to figure out how to make the same argument and follow that process through to complete an argument before moving on to the next one. 
that's where I think we have some of our major problems. Mm -hmm. Julia, I'd be interested in your thoughts as a policymaker who is weighing evidence from different parties, recognizing that it's highly unlikely that anyone is going to present evidence that's not in their favor, um, but also keeping in mind that the commission also has an agenda, as we've heard earlier, and has every right to have a policy agenda. How are you thinking about bias? Is it a problem? Is it addressed? Should it be addressed in different ways than perhaps it is today? So certainly, I mean, I think, you know, bias is always a problem. It's something that you have to look for in all research um, and, and sort of whenever humans are involved, right? Um, and so I think for us at the FCC, I think when we're evaluating, and, and I will also say um, that, you know, that sort of the funding constraints are real. OET nor OEA can spend their life going out um, and, and collecting data in ourselves on all of these problems, right? It just wouldn't, it wouldn't be efficient, it wouldn't be effective. And, and in many cases, you, know, you can do the cost benefit analysis on collecting that data and it's not there. And so in many cases, we really have to rely on the evidence coming in from both sides. And I think, and there are some things that we look for in terms of just trying to sort of tease out where the truth is. Um, number one is, you know, in my mind, showing your work is essential, right? So if you're going to be looking for, it, when we're looking at analyses, um, we want to see transparency. We, we try to provide transparency in our own analyses, and we want to see it in the analyses that are, that are brought to us. Um, I think, you know, there's, there is obviously understanding biases, motives, incentives that, that is inherent in sort of thinking about how much do we weigh each of these positions and, and how accurate do we think this is and is this realistic? But really, <laughs> we are looking at those biases. Um, and credibility certainly is important, right? I mean, I think, I think we all have people we think are more or less credible in terms of the work they do. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I think particularly in telecom, the economics and the engineering, it's a recursive game, right? You, you know, it's the same people on either side of the table over and over again. And so you, I think developing that credibility and sticking with, with that um, and for people doing research, you know, knowing the lines they're, they're not willing to cross and making that clear that, you know, that they, they're will, you know, we're all at times in our lives have been paid to, to argue for things. The question is how far are we willing to take that? Um, and then I think for the FCC, it's, it is taking all of this information in and then performing our own analysis to ensure that we really, we are comfortable with whatever the information is, right? So whatever the, the answer is. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, yes. And the question is, does bias exist in the commission? You know, of course it does. Everybody, politics is, is sort of inherently that, right? What, what I think we're trying to do and we're, when I think we're doing our job right, at least in OEA, and, and I guess, I'm guessing the same thing is true of OET, is performing as neutral um, an analysis as we can, understanding our biases, understanding the other biases that are out there, trying to sort of provide a most holistic view and offering that analysis up um, with its flaws. And, and that may not, you know, that's not necessarily the approach that the commission takes, but, but we do the commission a better service if we tried to be as um, you know, objective as possible internally and have a legitimate discussion about it. But of course, I mean, there are challenges always in that. Um, but that's, I think, you know, bias exists and really it's more a matter of how do you address it and deal with it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And looking at the time, I will pause on my questions for now to make sure we have a chance to answer some questions from the audience and others. And as Keith noted up top, following the wiser rule and in the grand Silicon Flatirons tradition, our first question will come from a student. So I'm very pleased to welcome Lily Wasser, who will have our first question. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just, we, you started addressing a little bit how you determine credibility, but if you could address that a little bit further, also on when you're looking at economic concerns, how do you really address what's credible economic evidence when you're looking at these policy issues and how they're going to affect us on an economic basis? Julia, I think that's to you. Yeah, probably, I'll start. So, um, so let me take the piece that I'm, I'm 
you know, when, when we're looking, so from a cost benefit analysis standpoint, when we're looking at the economics, you know, I think we're looking at um, really the, the whole welfare game, which is, um, you know, sort of what are the costs and benefits? What are the sort of more social welfare impacts that those could have? Um, and we are, you know, admittedly, so economists kind of inherently are less concerned with transfers than we are of, of costs and losses um, holistically. So, you know, that, that creates some funny things, but we do, when we're looking at cost benefit analysis, we're, we're trying to do that sort of more um, inherent economic, you know, uh, sort of economic costs and you know, losses and benefits, but then we're also looking at the whole picture um, and trying to factor in all of the other um, potential losses and, and the different sides of the equation. Um, and then in terms of, and I'm sorry, what was your first question again? I maybe. Um, I was just asking how you're kind of addressing the credibility of it, because obviously you're getting a lot of different data from all different sources. Yeah, and that's, I think that's where, you know, we get data from all sources, we want data from all sources, we ask for data from all sources, um, and then it really comes down to us evaluating, you know, do we think the analysis is sound on our own? And that's why we have, a, so the FCC has a team of over 60 economists who are looking at just that question. You know, are these analyses sound based on our own evaluation of them? Um, you know, we're then, again, we're looking for, have people shown their work? To the extent analysis is, you know, basically, you know, it has that backup of this is where the data comes from, then we can dig into that ourselves and then start to say, do we think these assumptions are realistic? If we change the assumptions to something that we think are more realistic, what happens here? Um, and so, you know, the extent to which economists are coming in and showing their work to us, it, that's hugely helpful. You know, we are sort of inherently also always looking at the biases. You know, everybody has a point of view, everybody has an incentive, and to the extent you're filing um, in, an, in an interested party in a proceeding, you clearly have an interest, and so we're taking that into account. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's, it's as much art as science. Um, and, you know, that's, that's sort of a big part of what we're doing every day is weighing these different sides um, and looking where we think, you know, the policy should be coming out. Um, also factoring, of course, what the, you know, the, the chairman is the, is the one at the FCC who's actually appointed. Um, so certainly their feeling on policy will at the end of the day matter when it comes to what the po ultimate policy decision is made. We just provide the evidence and, and evaluate the best we can. Thanks Lily Thank for that great question. And I'll also ask the other panelists to comment if you would like that question around credibility is such an important one and particularly for the students who may be in the audience thinking about becoming practitioners. Um, I'll, I'll hit hit you first, but how do you think about credibility when you know you're going to be in front of the commission on multiple issues over multiple years where you might be in a defensive posture versus an offensive posture? What are some rules of the road or some advice that you would offer to people? I don't know how this works for most people, but I tend to try to be extremely forthright uh, to, the, to the limit of actually being somewhat combative when I'm even with my own clients. <laughs> in a sense that I will not move from being truthful. Engineering is a very truthful uh, statement and your word is your bond in some respects. And so I think exactly what Julia was saying is what happens in even the engineering groups where you get a, you get a reputation when working with people to listening to what the question is, trying to understand where the commission is coming from, trying to educate them in a, and, and in, in a lot of different ways and trying to have them understand why you're looking at it in this perspective, why it's important, but also to be just so truthful that they know that you will not go off and say something to them that is wrong. You may not have all of the evidence. I mean, we're gonna say that, let's take it from the non-nefarious point of view. You don't have all the evidence. You don't know everything. No one knows all the different pieces. So that as long as you represent yourself as best you can, truthfully, Usually you build up that reputation where they can give you a call. And I've actually been contacted saying, what do you think about this? We have a question. Would you be willing to answer that question? To have that kind of interaction, okay, allows you 
to be able to understand and try to help really, you're trying to help your client, but you're actually trying to help the United States. We are all in this country to do policy correctly. Thanks, Paul. Russ or Patrick, do you have anything to add? I can add uh, a couple comments. I'll just be short. Um, <clears throat> you know, I'll go back to that number two statement, you know, promoting transparent, fair, economical, efficient, and effective spectrum management policies. I think it really comes down to when, you know, about both credibility and the economics, you know, the FCC is being hit from all sides of, hey, I want dedicated spectrum. I want shared spectrum. I want licensed spectrum. And so you have to understand you know, their point of view, they're trying to make the most economic use of spectrum. And for instance, licensed spectrum, you guarantee a certain level of investment from operators. Um, unlicensed, I think there's, you know, it's well known, there's a great track record in terms of the value, although it's very difficult to quantify some of these things. And I think that's where the FCC staff really needs help. Um, you know, we look at that from the FCC TAC, we work on a number of these challenges, but you know, realistically, too, it's how do we get more efficient use out of that spectrum? So from the credibility standpoint, we try to bring in the facts, the evidence, and present those to help drive policy. Thanks, Russ. Patrick, any quick thoughts? If not, we'll move on to the last question. No, we can move on. Great. So we do have a question from the <coughs> audience. Um, and it goes to harmful interference, which Dale spent quite a bit of time talking about today, among others. So this, uh, according to the questioner, this is more used in proceedings before the FCC to enable legal wiggle room for a given spectrum issue du jour than anything else. My question, in this age of big data, the CBRS, SAS operations, and SAS is a spectrum access system, um, is, and that there's a data mining opportunity, how can we begin to push in the direction of quantifying and defining harmful interference. And I will use my moderator post to say, and should we, an open question. Um, and then the second half of the question is, and is a quantitative measure or system of measurement for harmful interference even possible given the US regulatory context? And we have two minutes, so brief answers please, but a really interesting question that we could probably spend the next two hours on. Any volunteers to go first? I'll, I'll try to take 15 seconds. Um, Great, and then over to you, Patrick. Yeah, so I think this is a really critical issue. We're seeing, you know, the cost of creating harmful interference. I mean, you can buy $8 components to, you know, create interference on GPS um, that are USB or actually car cigarette pluggable, uh, $200 for a great spectrum interference um, capability. But I think this is something, yes, it can be quantified. We need to quantify it per Dale's um, you know, sort of outline. It's something where we have to really start to take a deeper look at. Patrick? So uh, you know, the defini uh, definition of harmful interference will depend uh, on the different systems. So in a lot of ways, it, it reminds me of Justice Stewart's uh, quip about obscenity. I know it when I see it. Uh, harmful interference is sort of like that in a lot of ways. Um, and I think Dale touched on a way to kind of get out of that uh, indeterminate outcome by focusing not necessarily on uh, harmful interference, but on um, uh, uh, interference limits. So that could be an objective criteria. And we've seen a little bit of movement in that uh, direction, um, in particular in the C-band proceeding and uh, having um, uh, 5G operators protect uh, incumbent adjacent channel earth station receivers. Uh, rather than uh, define it as protecting them from harmful interference, the commission chose uh, a power flux, power flux density value, uh, which is objective, which can be measured. And that's the dividing line between what is acceptable and what's not. So we think, you know, I think it's a, it's a real opportunity to kind of build mm -hmm. off of that um, and some of the innovation that, that Dale talked about. Great. Paul, sounds like you had some thoughts as well. Yeah, 20 seconds, very few thoughts. Right to the point, harmful interference not only doesn't matter on the services you provide, but it also depends upon where you are. Okay, I like using the example, uh, the amount of noise that you listen to in New York City, maybe not today, but in a normal New York City, versus what you would hear out in the middle of a cornfield in Wyoming or Kansas, whatever, the threshold is very different. 
And so the interesting part about it is, is that to understand that it's not, it's also very much in a sense circumstance related and where you're located and at what time you're located. So it's a very interesting process that should be really investigated in a much more, much more dramatic way, only because it'll make a very major impact on how much spectrum we can put into real use. Great. Julia, any thoughts on this or will you take a pass? All I'm going to say is I think I think that question as to how does this fit into the U.S. regulatory context is, is hugely important and one that we have to start really thinking about, right? I mean, we can collect this data, like all data, it's costly to collect, so we better be doing something with it if we're going to collect it. Um, and I think, you know, sort of determining what that is and first implementing that in the regulatory context is going to be really huge, and my guess is it's going to happen in baby steps. Um, so... Thank but you. I think it's possible. And with that, thank you again to all of the panelists for this good discussion and put in a plug for the air meet to follow. I'll be there. So I hope to see many of you there as well. Um, and on, on behalf of the entire panel, again, thank you to the, the folks at Silicon Flatirons for putting this together. Um, excited to finish off the end of one good day and um, be back on Thursday for another great session, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, and thank you again to all the panelists. That was a, a really interesting discussion. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Okay, so that's it for today. And uh, we pick up again tomorrow at 10 o'clock Mountain Time, 12 o'clock Eastern. But in the meantime, uh, it's time to head out for our, to our virtual breakout rooms so that we can get some networking uh, in with the speakers. So this is an important part of every Silicon Flatirons conference. We're doing our best to make the virtual experience, uh, you know, as much like the hallway experience as we could. I think everybody received a link to AirMeet and the link was also put in the chat window. AirMeet is the browser-based event platform that we're using for the breakouts. Now it's very critical that you need to log out of Zoom and then connect via AirMeet. If you've got them both on, there's some problems. So log out of Zoom, connect via AirMeet, and each breakout room, uh, which will be a table, will have the name of a speaker from today. And speakers will join their own tables and attendees are encouraged to walk the hallway and join any table and join any conversation that they like. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow.